we present the first in a three-part series featuring the definitive documentary about the CIA on company business. You brought with you um, some of those devices which would have enabled the CIA to use this poison for, we have indeed, for killing people. The round thing at the top is obviously the sight. It works by electricity. There's a battery in the handle and it sh fires a small dart. And the dart itself, when it strikes the, the, the uh, target, um, does the uh, target know that he's, about, that he's been hit and about to die? A special one was developed which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. As a murder instrument, that's about as efficient as you can get, isn't it? It, it, it is a weapon, a very serious weapon. I first uh, began working in intelligence uh, while I was in the Army in Germany during the Cold War years. Later, when I was a student at Penn State, I was uh, recruited by the CIA. The guy told me he was from DOD, Department of Defense. Uh, we were recruited, or uh, believing that we were being recruited by DOD. It wasn't until we got to Washington that we found out it was CIA. Uh, however, the day just before we left for Washington, we were sent a telegram that read something like, uh, your, uh, employment with the DOD will involve assignment to CIA and we didn't even know what CIA meant at the time didn't even know what the initial stood for a secret organization is a risk in any society I believe it's a risk that we must take for the net gain because I believe it's always going to be there. Now, let's say that we abolish the CIA. It's done so many bad things. Let's don't ever have this kind of intelligence organization again. Do you know what's going to happen? American presidents are strong-willed men. They wouldn't be in that office if they weren't. If they don't have an intelligence service, they're going to create their own. It may not be very big, and they may reach into the loony bin to find the people to run it. And they may call it the plumbers, but they will have it. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Japan has today surrendered. The last of our enemies is laid low. Now, back to New York. People who have seen Times Square celebrations before declare that this is the biggest uh, spectacle in New York history. Estimates of the crowd go beyond a half million. We just fought a war. And in a war, you conduct all sorts of operations, the uh, deception operations, uh, behind the lines activity, sabotage, all the rest of it. Uh, and I was involved in that, and the OSS was involved in that. We demobilized all our military forces at the end of 1945 and stripped our Navy and Army and Air Force. These Soviet forces were not demobilized, as the danger of Stalin's expansion, uh, that kind of uh, of uh, society seemed to be threatening to sweep around and uh, cover more of the world 
people were very concerned that they were faced with a new totalitarianism. It was the same as the Hitler one, but under new management. And consequently, we developed a CIA in order to conduct the subversive level of the struggle. The great burning question at the end of the war was how the United States was going to avert a return to the great unemployment of the Depression period of the 1930s. During the last phase of the war, production in the United States was double what it had been in its best pre-war year. And this exceedingly high production had been achieved with 10 million men under arms. There was only one way that the return to the unemployment of the Depression could be averted, and that was by creating foreign markets for our overproduction. This was the economic rationale behind the Marshall Plan and the reconstruction of the economy of Europe. We are following a definite and clear foreign policy. That policy has been, is now, and shall be to assist free men and free nations to recover from the devastation of war. We could choose the course of inaction. We could wait until depression caught up with us. Our other course is to take timely and forthright action. Preparing for the special session of Congress, the Foreign Policy Committee of Senate and House hears Secretary of State Marshall tell what's needed to give the free nations of Europe economic support. I recommend that you give immediate and urgent consideration to a bill authorizing the appropriation of sufficient funds to provide the supplies necessary to permit the people of these countries to continue to eat, to work, and to survive the winter. We find ourselves, our nation, in a world position of vast responsibility. We can act for our own good by acting for the world's good. The CIA comes into this because the political forces in Western Europe after World War II uh, that were prevailing had been the backbone of the resistance to fascism and they were the left-wing political parties, principally the communist parties. Uh, especially in France and Italy. These parties, knowing that the reconstruction of their economies would uh, bring economic and political dependence on the United States, opposed the Marshall Plan. And the CIA was partly set up in order to combat, um, on a political warfare basis, the efforts by left-wing political organizations in Europe to uh, impede the success of the Marshall Plan. Signing the bill that will enable our national military establishment to do more coordinating and less pulling in opposite directions, President Truman uses a number of pens. These, in turn, are passed out as souvenirs to the witnesses, one of whom is the boss of the armed forces, Secretary of Defense Johnson. The CIA was set up to first to collect intelligence and to analyze intelligence, to centralize intelligence, to get it all together so it could be all looked at together in the best academic tradition. Uh, also, however, it was set up in order to struggle at that subversive level with the subversive forces that we faced. The CIA from the very beginning, at least as early as 1951, has used the information that it has collected and it has used the information in order to penetrate and to manipulate the institutions of power in whatever country it is operating in order to influence the course of events in those countries. And essentially this uh, boils down to propping up those forces which are considered to be the friendly forces and in penetrating, dividing, weakening and ultimately destroying those forces which are considered to be the enemy forces. <laughs> The Italian election campaign at the crisis. Premier De Gasperi calls for votes to defend freedom and beat communism. And he champions America's Marshall Plan. Communist leader Togliatti in Rome hurls pro-Soviet, anti-American propaganda at an election campaign gathering of Italian Reds. To combat the communist peril in the Italian election, the Pontiff of Rome repeatedly urges the people to vote against the Reds. I 
I think that whenever we had the choice, we tried to support center democratic forces. I mean, that clearly that's what we did in Europe. Uh, we didn't support any fascist groups in Europe. We didn't have to because there were good socialists, good Christian Democrats. We did not go to the right-wing forces. I joined CIA in September 1951. Uh, the preceding year, uh, April 1950, NSC 68 was drawn up. Uh, it was a joint interagency working paper. Uh, it was inspired primarily by Dean Acheson, and it was the blueprint for the Cold War. It is not only the threat of direct military attack which must be considered, but also that of conquest by default, by pressure, by persuasion, by subversion, by neutralism, by all the paraphernalia of indirect aggression which the communist movement has used. It was the height of the Cold War. Senator McCarthy, Joe McCarthy, was terrorizing the nation with charges of a great internal communist conspiracy. The State Department, according to him, you will remember, those of you who are old enough, was filled with Soviet spies. Main Street, USA, at peace, unaware that a cabal of conspirators plots its enslavement. At Mossonet, Wisconsin, two former communists show how a highly organized minority, using the seizure techniques taught in Moscow, can take over a city. First, the mayor is hustled off to jail, and then the chief of police. In the Red Primer, an early lesson teaches the importance of controlling law enforcement. Without a controlled press, red tyranny could not survive, so the town's newspaper editor, who is likely to be independent, is quickly seized to adorn a concentration camp. Prepared propaganda speedily rolls from the once free presses, and the picture on the front page tells one and all who gets allegiance from now on. The official name of the government established by the revolution shall be known as the United Soviet States of America, USSA, affiliated with the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, of which Moscow is the capital of the worldwide communist superstate. The concept was that the Soviet Union was engaged in a worldwide effort to obtain domination everywhere. Well, the question is, uh, the machinery that was set up as a result of our experience in a hot war adequate to deal with what may well be a 25, 10, 25, or a 50-year struggle in the Cold War? The problems presented are entirely different. I think the Russians are counting on a lack of staying power on the part of our country. I think they feel that uh, we're sort of fat, rich, and slap happy, and we don't have uh, the staying power and the patience to put up with a long-term struggle. We have passed through a time of the awakening of people to the nature of the true danger in the world. We are now deep in a period of action. The institutions of power, which are um, penetrated and attempts are made to manipulate them, are the political parties, the security services, the military institutions, the trade union organizations especially, the youth and student movements, cultural organizations, professional societies, and in a very big way, the public information media. We need powerful radio stations abroad, operated without governmental restrictions, to tell in vivid and convincing form about the decency and essential fairness of democracy. The crusade for freedom will provide for the expansion of Radio Free Europe into a network of stations. They will be given the simplest, clearest charter in the world. Tell the truth. Radio Liberty was funded entirely with CIA funds, I think from the very beginning up until uh, 1971 and 1972. Radio Free Europe was supported in part by the Crusade for Freedom and later the Radio Free Europe Fund. These carry more than the message of freedom. They give specific instructions to the Russian people how to work for their liberation with maximum effectiveness and minimum danger under the very noses of the Soviet secret police. To achieve a truly free Russia, your allies 
the Einzelnen Kirsten need your help. They need moral support and your material aid. No one really knew that it was funded by CIA. When I say no one, obviously, some persons did. I'm not sure when I personally found out. It was fairly early. But uh, at that time, I think we took the position, which most Europeans do now, that uh, national intelligence is uh, part of the whole foreign policy, or for that matter, domestic policy of any country. And uh, our support for CIA during the 1950s was certainly considered patriotic. The film industry signs up in the campaign to help answer communist lies. Mr. Cecil B. DeMille says, Signing the Freedom Scroll today will cost you less than a minute of your time. Let it be your firm commitment to this warfare for the minds of men that this world under God shall have a new birth of freedom. One of the principal mechanisms which the CIA used after World War II um, in its programs to influence the course of events in different countries was the uh, use of front organizations. For example, in the youth field, the CIA set up the World Assembly of Youth, which continues today with its headquarters in Brussels. In the student field, the CIA set up the Coordinating Secretariat of National Unions of Students. The operation runs in a very simple way. Most people will join an outfit because their friends belong or because, they're, well, I guess it's a good idea that I belong to it. But only a few people ever bother to go to the meetings, and these people, of course, always end up as uh, executive officers. Of course, executive officers control all these organizations, and this was a technique that was used by uh, Cordmeyer and his uh, division in youth organizations and in uh, women's organizations uh, and other uh, such groups. In the trade union field, the CIA founded, or helped to found, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions with its headquarters in Brussels, which continues to exist today. My first job at CIA was case officer for a French uh, left operation, non-communist left, and it was then that I was case officer for uh, labor operations in France. And Irving Brown was then um, receiving money from us, which he was passing around in France. At St. Paul, AFL President William Green Center and Dick Walsh left, theatrical labor leader, here, Irving Brown give a first-hand report on the value of American motion pictures abroad. I have just returned from Europe, where as the representative of the American Federation of Labor for over four years, I have had the chance to see the terrific impact that the American movies are having on the peoples abroad, particularly those behind the Iron Curtain. This places a great responsibility upon the American people and the American motion picture industry. I, uh, as the European director of the CIO, had some concept of what it costs to provide technical assistance to trade unions in Europe. And I know on the very modest budget which the CIO could afford in those days, I could not possibly be a match for one Irving Brown, who was dispensing funds on a basis that uh, very early uh, began to raise doubts in my mind whether these funds were truly AFL funds. In 1947, during a general strike, the communist unions were about to take over France. Competent observers feared that there would be a fall of the government, and the French people were hungry. Many of them took to the streets. It was that, at that time that David Dubinsky's International Ladies Garment Workers Union went to the aid of a free French unions. J. Lovestone and Irving Brown, working for Dubinsky, gave money to a new union called the Force Ouvrière. Of course, labor unions cost a lot of money, and in those days, France was paralyzed. So when they ran out of money, they came to the Central Intelligence Agency. Those people were doing a great job, and we were very glad to help them. Premier Schumann strives to deal with a wave of strikes. Coal mines are tied up, 
Communist-controlled unions calling the workers out and stopping fuel production as winter comes. A general transport strike stopping the shipment of fuel and food in a country cold and hungry. Strikes are the communist tactic as the Marshall Plan develops economic aid to support freedom in France. The American program bitterly opposed by communists. The early days of the Marshall Plan when there were some political strikes called by communist trade union forces and perhaps uh, communist political elements to try to defeat the Marshall Plan, to try to block uh, foreign aid from being unloaded. It became a matter of breaking these strikes. And um, the U.S. government, through central intelligence, uh, called upon Irving Brown and Jay Lovestone to try to organize a counter move. And of course, uh, if you want to break a strike, uh, you go to boys who have big bare knuckles and who know how to wield the cudgeons. And they turn to uh, what could best be described as uh, the Corsican Mafia under the leadership of a uh, uh, well-known uh, Corsican uh, racketeer by the name of Ferry Pisani, who became uh, really uh, a paid agent of central intelligence and collaborated with Irving Brown and Lovestone in their operation to break the strikes. In about 1953, I terminated funds for Ferry Pisani. Of course, Brown did not like this, but uh, there was nothing for F Ferry Pisani to do at that time. And uh, probably he was involved in smuggling uh, heroin going through Marseille, and uh, he didn't need our money. During the executive board meeting of the ICFTU, I was acting labor attache, and I was escort officer for Mr. and Mrs. George Meany and uh, Mr. Meany's secretary, Virginia Tejas. On the last evening of their stay in Brussels, as I was driving Mr. Meany, Mrs. Meany, and Mr. Meany's secretary back to the Metropole Hotel, we got into discussion about European labor and international labor. And um, perhaps it was unfair of me to go into this kind of dialogue with George Meany because he did not know that I was working for CIA and that I had once been Washington case officer for Irving Brown's labor projects in France. I was the one who set his budget and cut his budget. Um, so it was, it, it was unfair, perhaps from that uh, point of view, uh, but I did take him on and I gave him uh, my views on how unpopular Irving Brown was and as a consequence how much damage he was doing free labor and discrediting people that he associated with because he had the reputation I knew it was deserved of being a big money bag man for CIA. Meany didn't know how to quite cope with this uh, except to explain to me that there were some things I did not know about. These were precisely the things that I knew everything about. The American Federation of Labor, during my time as Secretary Treasurer and as President, and the AFL CIO during my time as President, has never received any CIA money for any activity, either directly or indirectly. What's that? Yes, that applies to Irving Brown as well. When you've come through a devastating war, as the European countries did, and people literally were pulling themselves out of rubble, those first courageous trade unionists who had the courage to reestablish their organizations desperately deserved help. And much of the first help that went to them, from the AFL even, was legitimate was proper, was humanitarian. You know, you send care packages and you give mimeograph machines and so on. When it went beyond that and became a matter of twisting their arm and saying, look now, you know, you're dependent on our help. You've got to break up the old CGIL organization in Italy. And when they turned to a marvelous human being like Leon Blum, Nobel Prize winner, courageous French resistance hero, and turned to him and against his own better judgment 
forced him into breaking with his lifelong ties with the CGT, the Trade Union Federation of France. And when they financed the split in France and Italy, they isolated these heroic figures from the main body of the labor movement and thus destroyed their influence and made them captives of foreign largesse. And nothing will destroy the good name of a national trade union federation than to have it become known that they're dependent upon handouts from the rich uncles in America, especially if the rich uncle in America gets it from the CIA. Now the purpose of all these different activities, the political and the uh, front organizations in the different sectors of the population, were to uh, fill this political vacuum that existed after World War II and to fill it with those forces which would be favorable to close relations with the United States, the so-called Atlantic Alliance, and in order to preclude any participation in these organizations and in the national, the political life, by left-wing forces such as the Communist parties. It was to shove them aside and to isolate them so that development of Europe uh, for as many generations as possible could be, uh, could be brought under the control of those forces which are friendliest to the United States and to the interest of our corporations which were moving in part and parcel with the reconstruct reconstruction of Europe after World War II. In um, Washington, D.C., I worked on the Central America desk of the Mexico and Central American countries. That was back in 1957-58. And at that time, well, at first I, I saw it just as information gathering, and then I realized they were really intervening in the affairs of these countries. In this Guatemalan town of Equipulas, just occupied by anti-government forces, are the first evidences of that much publicized anti-communist revolution. This is headquarters for the once exiled officers leading the liberation forces. Colonel Miguel Mendoza is district commander under overall rebel chief Colonel Carlos Castillo Armas. Elsa would come home and say things like, well, they're buying votes in Guatemala or words to that effect, you know, and I'd say, well, now, Elsa, you must... You must have got something garbled, you know. The United States government would never do a thing like that. And I couldn't, couldn't believe this. In the nine years, I think I said a thousand times, the, the United States government would never do a thing like that. And then I would find out that, in fact, they had done exactly that. Serious trouble in Tehran, capital of oil-rich Iran. Its pro-Western ruler, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, has lost his throne temporarily at least. When his army failed to oust the dictatorial-minded Premier Mossadegh, the Shah himself was forced to flee for his life to neighboring Baghdad, another king without a country. In Rome, where he had fled, 33-year-old Shah Mohammed Reza Pahlavi hears astounding news. Royalist forces have revolted, arrested Dr. Mossadegh, and want their sovereign home. Army men are given principal credit for the sensational change. When the army turned against its Mossadegh appointed officers, it assured the return of the king. In 1953, a few CIA people managed to make some changes in, uh, in Iran that President Eisenhower liked very much. In 1954, a few of us in Guatemala made some changes that seemed almost without effort. However, the demands kept growing. Intelligence was asked to do what armies should have been done. It seemed so easy to hope that secret shenanigans could accomplish what an army should have been doing. We were uh, supporting every half-assed dictator, military junta, uh, oligarchy that existed uh, in the third world uh, as long as they promised to somehow maintain the status quo, which would, of course, be beneficial to uh, U.S. Uh, uh, geopolitical interests, uh, military interests, big business interests, and other uh, special interests. In front of the presidential palace in Havana, and it seems as far as the eye can see, Cubans, upwards of a million, five-sixths the population of this capital city, 
Nearly one out of every six persons on the island. Why are they here? Fidel Castro asked them. A graduate lawyer, Dr. Castro displays an eloquence and personal dynamism that completely sways the enormous throng. I felt that we were grossly mishandling the uh, national liberation movement and the emergence of national liberation leaders like Sukarno, Nasser, and Krumah, and so forth throughout the world. I did not believe that we should be trying to overthrow these people or assassinate these people, but instead that we should have worked with them. Premier of Cuba, Fidel Castro, emerges from his convalescence to address a youth congress and to announce that Cuba is expropriating United States-owned property in that country. The name is chiseled from the telephone building and signs torn down from this and other properties worth nearly a billion dollars. At the White House, Presidential News Secretary Haggerty announces a break in diplomatic relations with Cuba. There is a limit to what the United States in self-respect can endure. That limit has now been reached. I am to this day absolutely convinced that uh, we drove Fidel Castro into the arms of the Russian bear because uh, he was uh, frightened that we were going to murder him uh, and destroy his new Cuba, and he was absolutely right. <laughs> A French cargo ship, La Coubre, which had just docked with 76 tons of arms and ammunition for the Revolutionary Army, blew up as hundreds of workers unloaded the cargo. Seventy are dead and over 300 wounded. Government sources have indicated that there is every reason to suspect sabotage. The way it would start is maybe an ambassador, maybe a CIA officer, maybe somebody here in Washington, maybe somebody in the White House would suggest that it would be a good idea to help a certain group in another country. That would be looked at to see if we have the contacts, uh, who reliable people we could deal with, and a plan would be put together as to how this would be done. That plan would then be approved within CIA as sensible, it would then be submitted to an interagency group and then submitted to the president for final okay. Uh, if the president's approval, then the agency would go ahead. Forty-six were wounded, two killed under questionable circumstances. Castro, in a broadcast speech lasting most of the night, says bombs from U.S.-based planes are responsible for the casualties. Other reports say it was men in cars. Whatever his reasons, Castro stirs strong feelings of anger against the United States. One of the operations they had was to burn the cane fields. As I understand the way it was done, they had people in frogman suits. They would take them out to the coast of Cuba, jump into the water with incendiary devices in their frogman outfits, come up on the beach, plant these incendiary devices in the cane fields, and swim back to the boat. They'd take off, and 10, 15 minutes later, the incendiary device would go off, and it'd start a big fire in the cane field. Fidel señala que al sur de la provincia de Pinar del Río. Fidel indicates that in the south, in Pinar del Río province, our radar detected a large ship launching smaller craft. The CIA is in direct control of these operations. It is the CIA which has been organizing the attacks the infiltration of saboteurs, arms, and explosives. The CIA has been doing all this through people it has directly recruited. Uh, has a decision been reached uh, on how far this country would be willing to go in uh, helping an anti-Castro uh, uprising or invasion in Cuba? Well, first I want to say that there will not be under any conditions be an intervention in Cuba by United States Armed Forces. This government will do everything it possibly can, and I think it can meet its responsibilities to make sure that there are no Americans involved in any action inside Cuba. There's no question that American presidents have found it convenient to make an operation secret 
because that way uh, it obviates the necessity for public debate. In many cases, it's obvi obviated the necessity for any sort of discussion in the Congress. Indeed, that's what led to the fiasco of the Bay of Pigs. Gee, we have another big one to do, and we'll keep it secret, too, when it couldn't be kept secret. Cuban revolutionary troops such as these have invaded Castro's leftist island fortress, reportedly rallied by a mysterious coded radio message. Alert, alert, look well at the rainbow. The fish will be running very soon. From the sea and by parachute, the rebels have struck along the coast within 90 miles of Havana. Initial accounts of the fighting sketchy, but strafing and bombing of communications and military targets reported with heavy casualties. Meanwhile, in Havana, acting foreign minister Olivares shows foreign envoys and newsmen scorched fragments of what may have been rockets fired during the B-26 raids. As might be expected, he points an accusing finger at the U.S. The same line is followed at a dramatic meeting of the United Nations General Assembly's political committee by Cuban Foreign Minister Raul Roa. Charging his nation has been invaded by what he terms mercenaries from Guatemala and Florida. Guatemala y de la Florida. Quickly, forcefully, the charges are denied by Chief U.S. Delegate Adley E. Stevenson. These charges are totally false, and I deny them categorically. The United States has committed no aggression against Cuba, and no offensive has been launched from Florida or from any other part of the United States. I had been stationed in Cuba on two occasions, in 1955 and 1956. Then I returned um, in 1959, 58, I was there 59 and 60 before I had to leave rather abruptly. I had an affinity for Cuba. The Cuban people are marvelous. Um, I'd seen what was going on there. And many of the participants in the Bay of Pigs were on that landing force because I had known them personally in Cuba. And I had recommended on a number of occasions that such and such a person would be a good uh, man to have in the brigade. So uh, when that broadcast came from the beach and the leader said, we're standing in the water and there's nothing else we can do, and he cursed. He cursed us. I felt he was cursing me too. Tragic epilogue to a gallant venture. Outside the Miami headquarters of the Cuban Revolutionary Front, exiled wives and mothers seek word of the men who participated in the ill-starred liberation invasion. For most, no news is bitter news, especially as in Havana, Fidel Castro in a four-hour television harangue shouts death for all 700 captives he claims taken in the abortive landing. Miles away in the serenity of Camp David, President Kennedy and former President Eisenhower confer on the repercussions of the Cuban episode. General Eisenhower promises bipartisan support for the president in this crisis as the president moves to the next round of the unceasing east-west power struggle over Cuba. I've said uh, as much as uh, I feel can be usefully said by me in regard to the events of the past few days. Further statements, uh, detailed uh, discussions are not to uh, conceal responsibility because I'm the responsible officer of the government, but merely because I, uh, and that is quite obvious, but merely because I do not uh, believe that uh, such a discussion uh, would benefit us during uh, the present uh, difficult uh, situation. Secretary gave us a crisp uh, clinical analysis uh, of the death of the Cuban venture. But of course, uh, no post-mortem can revive a court. When the Bay of Pigs failed, um, I was sitting in the building on that night that everyone knew that it was a failure, and Robert Kennedy came in in his shirt sleeves, and he had been sent there by his brother to clean that place out. He wanted to find out what had gone wrong. 
and do something about it. The result, however, was that Bobby Kennedy fell in love with the concept of clandestine operations. And we now know there is one question that's not been answered. Did President Kennedy and did Bobby Kennedy know that there were assassination plans against Fidel Castro? It's an unanswered question. The one thing that I'm absolutely sure of is that not only they knew, but they wished uh, for the continuance of that long period after the Bay of Pigs, in which there were many actions taken against Cuba. To put it precisely, there was at one point when Bobby Kennedy said, when are you fellows going to get off your bottoms and do something about Fidel Castro? There were found some, uh, a, a suit, a wetsuit, uh, a uh, clamshell, various things that were on the shelf in the agency that were regarded as things that might be used in uh, possibly killing Castro or being used against him, which never came off the shelf or never used. If that's a plot to have uh, created this, then I will back up and say that then we ought to enumerate every single uh, item that conceivably had to do with the invasions of Cuba, which we were constantly running. Uh, under the government aegis, we had uh, uh, um, task forces that were striking at Cuba constantly. We were attempting to blow up power plants. We were attempting to ruin uh, sugar mills. We were attempting to do all kinds of things during this period. This was a matter of American government policy. This wasn't the CIA. Now, if those things taper over into assassination plots, maybe so. Why didn't you want to tell the Warren Commission, or why didn't you tell the Warren Commission about the efforts to get rid of, of Fidel Castro or to overthrow the Cuban government? But Mr. Dodd, you're singling me out as to why I didn't march up and tell the Warren Commission when these operations against uh, Cuba were known to the Attorney General of the United States, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, the President of the United States himself, although he at that point was dead. I mean, all kinds of people knew about these operations high up in the government. Now, why am I singled out as the fellow that it should have gone up and identified a government operation to get rid of Castro. And it was a government-wide operation supported by the Defense Department, supported by the National Security Council, supported by almost everybody in high position in the government. As far as I ever knew or know now, no one in the White House or at the cabinet level ever gave any approval of any kind to any CIA effort to assassinate anyone. I told the committee in particular that it is wholly inconsistent with what I know of President Kennedy and his brother Robert, that either of them would ever have given any such order or authorization or consent to anyone through any channel. You were head of the agency during the time when most of these allegations Occurred. What, uh, what did you tell the commission about well, your knowledge of assassination plots? I had no knowledge of it whatsoever. And as you know, uh, I stated that there was feasibility or lack of feasibility. There obviously were discussions of the question of whether such matters had been planned, uh, but uh, I had to plead ignorance because none were brought to my attention, and therefore I knew nothing of them. No president in his right mind is going to say, uh, Dear uh, Director, uh, I hereby order you to assassinate Fidel Castro. Uh, in fact, he will probably do the exact opposite. He will issue what is known in the trade as a non-order or uh, a non-directive. He will say, We have these terrible problems down here in Cuba. And um, it's quite obvious to, to all of us that uh, the key to it is Fidel Castro. Now, if we could just get rid of that person, uh, maybe, uh, maybe we could work out uh, some, some kind of an arrangement. Uh, but of course, you know, we can't do anything like that. That would be wrong. Um, and uh, so uh, I don't know what we're going to do about it. We're just going to have to make the best of it and plug along. Now, he is saying this, say, at a, at a luncheon with uh, 
with uh, McNamara and Rusk and uh, maybe Helm, say, uh, or McCone, whoever was uh, director at the time, well, went over from McCone to Helms. Uh, now, these men are astute enough to know that what the president is really telling them is get rid of Castro. But I'm not going to put it in writing, and I've already made a statement for the record that I'm against it. In the event anything ever goes wrong, I'll be able to say, didn't I tell you that would be wrong? Could you uh, tell this committee uh, uh, who the individuals were involving mafia chieftains or organized crime figures? As far as I'm aware, in that, on that particular situation, it was uh, William K. Harvey who was in touch with John Roselli, and it was Harvey and Roselli who were attempting to find, if I understood it correctly, some channel from uh, Florida into Havana. Uh, I also understand that there was a question of poison pills which were supposed to be transported to Havana. There was never any evidence that they were ever transported there or ever left the United States. Uh, there was never any evidence that uh, this plot ever left the, uh, the Florida mainland. And uh, if it was an indeed an assassin flash an assassination plot, it was misadvertised to me because I had understood it was an effort to see if a connection could be made between the uh, Mafia in Florida and the Mafia in Havana, and to the best of my knowledge, the connection never was made. Sometime in 1960, uh, during a period wherein for some previous years I had been doing work for the CIA, I was approached by my project officer who asked me if in connection with a planned invasion in Cuba, I would contact a Mr. John Roselli. We started having meetings in uh, Miami. During one of those meetings in Miami, I was introduced to a Mr. Sam Gold, who subsequently uh, turned out to be uh, Mr. Giancana. In any uh, dirty job, and such as paramilitary activities, uh, uh, assassinations, um, sabotage, uh, and the like, what are known as special ops, uh, Almost invariably, uh, the uh, agency direct involvement of the agency officer, the career officer, ends in the planning stage. And sometimes, uh, even before that, just the policy decision-making stage. The dirty work will be carried out by either contract agents or uh, one-time agents, uh, gangsters, uh, uh, mercenary, whoever happens to, uh, to be available, whatever assets are, uh, are available for at, the, at that moment. We were told it was important in connection with the uh, invasion of Cuba. At that time, to dispose of Mr. Castro and and to the word dispose, you can add uh, anything you want. It is likely that at the very moment President Kennedy was shot, a CIA officer was meeting with a Cuban agent in Paris and giving him an assassination device for use against Castro. Now, I read this, and, uh, and again, I'm reading from the same report uh, that we read from earlier. They're calling it an assassination device. Are we getting semantical here again? I believe it was a hypodermic syringe they'd given him with some, something called black leaf number 40 in it. Uh, this was in response to Amlash's request that he be provided uh, some sort of a device whereby he could kill Castro. He returned this device to the case officer. The case officer brought it back to uh, Washington and that was the end of the uh, plot. Okay, but, but for purposes of, of discussion, the officer gave this uh, uh, Cuban, uh, this agent, in Paris, 
a device with that material you described in it, I presume the material if injected into a human being would kill him. Is that correct? I would think so, yes. So the agent gives the Cuban agent the device to kill somebody. I'm sorry I didn't give him a pistol because it would have made the whole thing a lot simpler and less exotic. Well, whether it's a pistol or a needle, if AMLASH is a political plot to destabilize the government, what in the blazes are we giving an agent a device that will kill Castro with for if it's not an assassination plot? Well, if you want to have it that way, why don't you just have it that way? Well, I don't want, it's not a question of what I want. Uh, oh, I think it is what you want, Mr. Dodd. Mr. Helms, I'm reading to you from reports here, prepared at your request by the Inspector General. I understand that. I'm not that. fabricating this or creating well, out of all my... I understand that. I'm quoting. I understand that. Well, it's, it's not a question of what I want. It's a question of what this committee would like to know, and the committee is, is not satisfied, I don't believe at this point, as to exactly what the characterization of AMLASH was. Well, I've told you what I believe the ca characterization of AMLASH to be. Well, how if does that jive with can... this? If you want, if because we gave him a gun or a hypodermic syringe or whatever the case may be at his request because he had aims on Castro, if that is your definition of an assassination of plot, then have it that way. That's quite satisfactory with me. But don't you open yourself to blackmail? In other words, if you're involved in a covert operation and you're using elements, like for instance the mafia in some of the assassination attempts against Castro, isn't that really a, a very dangerous thing to get involved in? You bet it is. It's very, very tricky. Um, the Mafia. Aren't you getting into trouble when you use them during World War II? As we now recently read, we use them in New York City. I had only known that we'd use them in Marseille uh, on the docks there. Of course, it's a tricky business. It's a part of the evaluation that a good intelligence officer and a good policymaker will make in deciding whether to use any person or any instrument or any political organization. There's no question. But it's very tricky in the setup that the agency has where the dirty work is done by uh, uh, contract people or one-time uh, uh, hirees and so forth. Uh, obviously, if uh, anything goes wrong, they can be disavowed. Um, if um, the person uh, turns bad, turns sour, and uh, may uh, want to speak out, and may possibly have some credibility and or evidence, well then uh, uh, stronger action is called for and uh, you can have uh, the ultimate termination uh, of the agent. When the police arrived, they found Mr. Gincana laying on the floor, dead, been shot numerous times in the upper part of his body and throat. Approximately six shots believed to be fired from a 22 caliber weapon. Is there anything to support the theory that uh, Giancana's killing may have been in some way uh, connected with his involvement with an alleged CIA plot to assassinate Fidel Castro? We know nothing about that. Uh, we have nothing to lead us to believe that at all. One of the conclusions the Senate came to after eight months of study, one of the conclusions was that no foreign leader had ever been assassinated by CIA. Now, it wasn't for want of trying in Castro's case, of course, but that's the only case in which there was any substantial effort made against one. And yet, I think the world as a whole thinks that CIA was around trying to assassinate everybody, and it's just plain false. Patrice Lumumba comes back to Leopoldville a prisoner. The former Congo premier who was captured when he fled inland no longer wears the tuft of whiskers on his chin that helped to identify him. His arrest provoked several clashes between Lumumba followers and Congolese army troops. But Congo strongman Colonel Joseph Mobuto, shown as he watches Lumumba arrive, says he is prepared to put down any uprising. Mobuto enjoys the sight of Lumumba being tied up more firmly for transfer to the garrison town of Teesville. A soldier tries to stuff into Lumumba's mouth a crumpled speech asserting his claim to power. The former premier shows no emotion. It may be the end of a chapter, but not yet the end of the Congo story. In training down at uh, Camp Perry at the farm, uh, a CIA officer, middle grade officer at that time, was telling us about his career. And one of the things he threw out to illustrate the adventures you get into 
was uh, finding yourself in Lubumbashi and the Katanga with Lumumba's body in the back, in the trunk of your car, driving around town trying to figure out what to do with it. One of Mr. Lumumba's weaknesses was his uh, propensity to turn matters over to the Soviet Union. So I would think that uh, his death, unless it results in a kind of martyrdom that might prove useful to the Russians, would be regarded as a blow to their interests. The CIA had developed a program to assassinate Lumumba under De uh, Devlin's encouragement and, and uh, management. The, the program they developed, the operation, didn't work. They didn't follow through on it. It was to give uh, poison to Lumumba, and they couldn't find a, a setting in which to, to get the poison to him successfully in a way that it wouldn't appear to be a CIA operation. I mean, you couldn't invite him to a cocktail party and, and uh, give him a drink and have him die a short time later, obviously. And so they gave up on it. Uh, they got cold feet. Uh, and instead, they handled it by the chief of station talking to Mobutu about the threat that Lumumba posed, and Mobutu going out and killing Lumumba, having his men kill Lumumba. What about the CIA's relationship with Mobutu? Were they paying him money? Yes, indeed. Uh, I was there in 1968 when the chief of station told the, the story about having been the day before, that day having gone to make a payment to Mobutu of cash, $25,000, and Mobutu saying, keep the money, I don't, uh, I don't need it. Uh, and by, by then, of course, Mobutu's European bank account was so huge that uh, 25000 was nothing to him. The CIA works through the reactionary forces, essentially, uh, or the, the middle roading or the social democratic forces, whichever ones they're trying to support. They work through these people. In the CIA, there is a, a distinction made between the career U.S. citizen employees, like I was, uh, that is the officers and staff, and the people who actually do the work at the end of the line, uh, who are the agents. An agent um, is a person who is recruited and hired to perform a specific intelligence or covert action task in a particular area at a particular moment in time. And so he is, or she, uh, is an indigenous person. One, one time in particular, the chief of China branch had come to my window to draw funds. And he uh, was drawing funds for death benefits for a person by the name of Dave who had been sent to China as an agent. And he said, well, we lost another body today. And I said, well, this seems like a very callous way to talk about a human life. And he said, well, Jim, we can't let our emotions interfere with our operational effectiveness. One of my favorite agents, a charming individual who looked and acted, as a matter of fact, very much like Flip Wilson, was quite talented and just a pleasure and a delight to be around. Uh, I left the country reassigned, and a, a week or two later, he was uh, uh, executed shot by the police, just picked him up and shot him without trial. And uh, he would not have been shot if he had not been working for me during this period of time. The situation in, uh, that an intelligence officer faces when he attempts to get someone to serve the interests of the United States rather than the interests of his own country is precisely the kind of thing that a con man is doing when he's working on the mark. The only person who doesn't know what the game is uh, when con men are working is the mark. The only person who really doesn't know what the game is in an intelligence recruitment is the target of that recruitment. Some of the jobs of intelligence are one which can best be performed by people who are themselves a little devious uh, so they can get at the root of the matter. Um, if you wanted to invite a dozen people to spend the rest of your life with you on a desert island, I wouldn't suggest that you invite a bunch of spies. But I believe someone has to do intelligence work, so I did it. That's the end of the first in our three-part series featuring the award-winning documentary on company business. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network.
Austin, Texas. Goodbye. The CIAs on company business all through Latin America. Maybe in Ecuador, and maybe in Argentina, and maybe in Brazil. But what's the meanie connection and the point of killing an American cop in Uruguay? Who's behind political torture and the bomb squads? Part two of the award-winning documentary on company business, tonight on Alternative Views. job in the CIA after the training program was over was to do name checks for all of the prospective um, uh, name checks of all of the prospective Venezuelan employees of the Creole Petroleum Company. Name checks means that a name is taken and in this case I got all of these names from our office in Caracas, Venezuela and I would check the names against all of the CIA files which are computerized and mechanized searching for possible indications of left-wing political sympathies or membership. On those that I uh, found data, I would send that back to Caracas, where it would be turned over to the Creole office uh, in uh, Caracas, and those people wouldn't be hired. Uh, it's uh, worth saying that the Creole Petroleum Company is one of the principal subsidiaries abroad of the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey, Exxon, which, as we all know, is a pillar of the Rockefeller family fortune. This is a specific example of the CIA uh, assisting outright the, a multinational corporation. But in general terms, everything that the CIA is doing in the propaganda area and in the political warfare area uh, tends in one way or another to help create the optimum operating conditions for multinational corporations in that particular country. Following the Bay of Pigs, there was a considerable new effort throughout Latin America to head off what was called the export of the Castro Revolution. And we were engaged in this from the Rio Grande uh, to uh, Tierra del Fuego, the foot of Argentina. As far as the United States is concerned, the encouragement and subver support of subversion by the Castro regime against other countries of this hemisphere is not a subject for bargaining. It simply must stop. At any one time, uh, down in Latin in Ecuador, we had on our payroll or in an intimate working relationship with our station um, one vice president, a president of the Chamber of Deputies, a president of the Senate, a vice president of the Senate, a number of senators, a number of deputies, uh, the secretary general of the Democratic so Socialist Party. Uh, we even created a party down there which we called the Popular Revolutionary Liberal Party, which would appeal to a lot of different people. We had extensive propaganda operations during this period also. The outstanding liberal columnist of the country, Gustavo Salgado, who wrote for El Comercio, which was the, one of the principal dailies under pen names, working for us, writing up our material and publishing it as if it were his own. We would publish small notices, which would be practically hysterical outcries against the growth of communism in Ecuador or a specific issue such as the visit of diplomats from some communist country. 
our participation consisted in creating the conditions of fear and at times hysteria with regard to the growth of the left-wing political organizations in Ecuador, such as the communist uh, organizations, and um, the fear with regard to the influence of the Cuban Revolution. Our themes were the threat of these developments to traditional Ecuadorian values. And when I speak of Ecuador, I am speaking of most of the rest of, the Latin, of Latin America too. The family, religion, and tradition, essentially. Because when you were in Argentina, you had developed a relationship with the producer of the Argentine newsreel. And could you mention how that yeah. worked? Or well, what we did in that, in that instance was take um, stories, news stories regarding world events, or Russian activities, or U.S. activities regarding Cuba, and Cuban activities in Latin America, and we would uh, twist the story uh, so that it would have a, uh, a context, perhaps, or sometimes an explicit um, statement of uh, information which was really not true, but which supported the position that we had. This was the way the news was presented. Uh, we, we worked in uh, a commentary uh, that presented the slant that we wanted. The use of forged documents and false documents is another uh, area in which the CIA can bring about a very timely um, uh, effect. In Ecuador, for example, we uh, at one point wanted to uh, expose the preparations for guerrilla activity of a particular organization, and while one of its leaders was in Cuba on a trip, we wrote up what would appear to be, the way we wrote it, his report to the Cubans. We put this report in a toothpaste tube. This was planted in his luggage when he returned on this trip and discovered by our people in the um, Treasury Ministry, and he was immediately thrown into jail, and when the report was finally published in the newspapers, it caused a sensation all across the country. We were able to force the Ecuadorian government to break relations with Cuba, and at the same time we were able to promote repression of left-wing political organizations, eventually establishing a military junta, which took over in July of 1963. When I was in Argentina, the most uh, interesting thing we had to do regarding Castro was to drum up support on the part of the Argentine government uh, for the Venezuelan charge that Castro was supplying guerrillas uh, in Venezuela uh, with arms. The arm cache was found in November 1963. I had served, before going down to Argentina, as Venezuelan desk officer. And I was surprised that um, one of the things that was developed as proof uh, was um, a series of statements by some man who had been captured back at the time when I was desk officer. And somehow, these arms were supposed to be delivered two years later, supposed to be tied in with an urban guerrilla plot that he confessed to. Well, in the first place, everybody who becomes a prisoner of uh, the security police in Latin America usually confesses, and knowing uh, what our directives were and what we had to do to try to convince the Argentines of this, I have some suspicion uh, about the reality of uh, this arms cache as um, a Cuban uh, operation. I think it might well have been planted by us. Let us say to our brothers in Venezuela, we are with you in full solidarity and will act with you to ensure the safety of your democracy. Venezuela did get its resolution condemning Castro passed by the OAS and Castro was ostracized economically and politically in the rest of the hemisphere, which of course was the major objective of uh, Kennedy's policy toward Cuba. The hemisphere is now solid with respect to Cuba. Uh, 19 of the 20 nations have broken diplomatic relations. The foreign ministers of the hemisphere 
have now applied all of the, what might be called, the peaceful remedies under the Rio Treaty. Castro's course is not the path of the future. This was illustrated in Brazil, where tendencies moving in the Castro direction were called to a halt very quickly by the, um, those who believed in a constitutional democracy in that country, the Congress, the governors, the armed forces. between communism and democracy is going to be finally settled not in the councils of diplomats or by the heads of government, but in the hearts and the minds, yes, and the stomachs of the multitudes of the ordinary working people of Asia, of Africa, of Europe, yes, and of the Americas too. The voice of our America which can speak most clearly and persuasively to these people is the voice of American labor, of the AFL-CIO. I got a call from uh, Washington if I would be interested in a position in Latin America. Well, to me, here's a little man coming out of the ghettos. Um, I felt it was a big opportunity. I didn't even know where Latin America was at that time. Uh, Who called you from Washington? Uh, Tom Robles. See, Tom Robles and I had been friends here. Uh, Tom Robles was uh, the secretary of the uh, state of Val CIO in uh, those years. Very strong man, very strong labor man. Had a lot of guts in those years. And uh, he was instrumental in my being called to Washington to be interviewed for this particular position in uh, uh, Brazil. My position was going to be administrator and organizer for the Postal Telegraph Telephone International, which was uh, later on I learned that it was uh, one of these phony organizations under the CIA. My boss was uh, Wallace Leggy, who was uh, one of John McCone's uh, top hands. John McCone at that time was the head of the CIA. In August of 1960, when we came to a full realization as to what had happened to the Cuban workers and the entire Cuban people under Castro, the AFL-CIO appropriated $20,000 for the purpose of studying the establishment of a mechanism through which we would help to strengthen the free labor unions of Latin America and develop trade union leadership. CIA's trade union operations are affected through a vast bureaucracy of people. These are the officers of the international trade unions and of the national unions, especially in the United States, through which the CIA is able to infiltrate and um, manipulate the international unions. Uh, of course, Mr. Meany is, uh, has been in the past uh, one of the principal, if not the principal, uh, U.S. trade unionist through which these operations are affected. I am Andy McClellan. I'm the Inter-American representative of the AFL-CIO and have been since 1964. Prior to that time, I was the associate inter-American representative. And prior to that time, I was inter-American representative of the International Union of Food and Allied Workers based in Geneva, but working in Latin America. I'm the executive director of the American Institute for Free Labor Development. Uh, prior to that time, as a matter of fact, I've been the executive director now for some 10 years, and I've been with the American Institute for Free Labor Development since its founding, and 1962. Uh, for the um, period immediately prior to 1962, I was the Inter-American Representative of the Postal Telegraph and Telephone International, uh, which has headquarters in Switzerland, but I was their, um, their representative in the Western Hemisphere. Didn't they tell you what you were going to be doing in the labor movement in, in Brazil? The idea was to, to uh, well, they don't explain anything. You go there with the impression that you are going there to do a labor job to represent the membership. This was my impression of it. They didn't tell me otherwise. 
So I started tackling the problems, combating the management for better uh, conditions, working conditions, higher salaries, lenient uh, rules, um, what you do in the labor movement. Apparently I was doing the wrong thing because uh, three months later I was uh, through a courier that was sent to Brazil where I had to go travel for about four or five hours, go all over the city to meet this guy who was just across the street from my office. But they wanted to make sure that there weren't any enemies following me. So then they instructed me that I was to uh, uh, return to Washington. Uh, that was in November, shortly before Thanksgiving. And go what for year? Uh, that was in 1962, same year that I started there, to uh, be trained on uh, clandestine activities. Leggy pointed out to me that we were organizing for, the, for 1964. See? And he was reorganizing his forces in D.C. He was ahead of the, the whole PTTI operation then. And he says, Richard, look, we're organizing against the communists uh, for 1964. So your job is to organize within the your field as a communicator to organize against the communists. Later on, after I got trained uh, in New York, I felt, well, it was a brainwash type of thing. Uh, uh, I became a re re very fanatic. I was a real fanatic then. There have been some people who have accused uh, the AFL-CIO of collaborating with the CIA. And what would be your uh, response to that accusation? I think that is so ridiculous and so infantile, so juvenile, to make such an accusation. And you, Mr. Doherty? Oh, I agree. I, I don't know of any labor leader that wouldn't uh, out and out deny such an accusation. It's just not true. In Latin America, one of the principal and most effective of the trade unionists, of the American trade unionists who worked with us, was Bill Doherty. Uh, he had originally started in the uh, Post Telegraph and Telephone Workers International, uh, coming up through the Communications Workers of America. Uh, later on, he was transferred into the American Institute for Free Labor Development. This was set up during the Kennedy period and uh, is a joint effort by American trade unionists like George Meany and the heads of American-based multinational corporations which operate in Latin America. The cover for this type of activity is indeed education and social projects such, such as the development of cooperatives and housing. But the real reason is to create cadres of organizers who after their training in the AIFLD is over, they can go back to their industries and spend one year or two years or even longer doing nothing but organizing. And this is the 75th class that has graduated from Front Royal from the time that we started the programs out there. This particular group has been studying democratic trade unionism. It is our hope that they will go back to their respective countries and put into practice some of the things that they have learned while they were here at Front Royal. Concluding our, our luncheon today, and wishing you not only in my name, but in the name of, of President George Meany of the AFL-CIO. Dándoles no solamente el nombre mío, sino el nombre del Presidente George Meany of the AFL-CIO. I'd like to leave you a thought in Spanish. Quisiera dejarles con un pensamiento en español. That comes from one of the great political and one of the great literary geniuses of this century and of the past century in Latin America. Yeah, they're one of those grandes, the grandes figuras políticas y literarias de este siglo. The, true, siglo the true liberator of his country. El auténtico libertador de su país. From heaven, who is embarrassed by the shame that now now exists in Cuba because of the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. That great Cuban Jose Martí one time said, Ese gran cubano, Jose Martí, una vez dijo, El mundo se divide en dos ramos. The world is divided into two camps. Los que aman y construyen. Those who love and build. Los que odian y destruyen. And those who hate and destroy. Nosotros, compañeros sindicalistas libres, somos que amamos y construimos. We are, Váyanse con Dios, compañeros. We are the lovers and builders. Go with God. These uh, institutes that were created by the AFL-CIO as their major instrument and vehicles now for international work 
uh, has on its boards of directors prominent American employers. Uh, for instance, the uh, uh, American Institute for uh, Free Labor Development in Latin America has for many years had as chairman of its board uh, one Peter Grace. And if one looks at the long list of corporations that initially contributed to the establishment of the AFL's American Institute for Free Labor Development, it includes not only uh, United Fruit, but uh, Anaconda Copper, and a whole string of U.S. corporations that have never voluntarily accepted uh, their obligation to pay decent wages and provide good working conditions in the United States. They always had to be forced to do it through union organization and strike action, etc. And why suddenly these corporate interests now should be embraced as allies and be foisted on Latin American labor or any other American uh, labor groups, any other Latin American labor groups, as people with credentials suitable for picking future trade union leaders and training them, this is beyond my imagination. We spend the first nine months yet to get back instructing other people in our, in our branch institution in Latin America. And what they do after that nine months is over, I can't say, but if they join some political party that's against the regime in power, I, 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 think, I think it's stretching, uh, stretching uh, your imagination quite a bit if you're going to attribute that to what the AIFLD done while they were up here. We were supposed to get the revolution going by May of 1964. I would call my leadership and I tell them, look, this is what we have to do. Huh? We have to get the people on our side because the communists have a bigger membership than we do. So you have to go out there and pull the membership away from them. See, and this is where the, the idea of training our leadership to go to Front Royal came into being. This is J. Peter Grace, and he says here, AIFLD men also helped drive communists from control of British Guiana. They prevented the communists from taking over powerful unions in Honduras and helped to drive the communists from strong jugular unions in Brazil. Could you go back to that period and sort of describe what the atmosphere was in Latin America? In well, the years that we were living in, uh, in the early 60s, I think, Andy, you would agree with me, in, a, in an era when we were uh, uh, in the streets battling for the lives of the free trade union movement against what was then a more powerful uh, communist trade union movement that since then, in my estimation, uh, has lost an awful lot of its, uh, its appeal and its attraction and its ability to maneuver. I was doing just exactly what Bill Doherty had done all, for years and years in Brazil, see, not only, only in Brazil but all over the country, all over the Latin American countries. So. Uh, Bill Dory now heading the AIFLD for the same type of operation now. Go around buying people. So I would recommend maybe six, seven, eight people which were good potentials as labor organizers and I would put them on a plane, send them down to Front Royal. They would be paid there. They got their lodging, their meals, the whole works. And then I would support their families in Brazil. And was this part of the preparation for what happened in 1964? That was the object of the whole thing. A half a world away, troops are called out in the suburbs of Rio de Janeiro to quell rioting over President Joao Goulart's attempts to form a new Brazilian government after the resignation of Prime Minister Tancredo Neves and his cabinet. Food stores are looted as dealers hold back supplies of beans, rice and other staples because they feel government price controls are set too low. Order is restored, but not before 11 persons are killed and a crippling general strike is called over the power struggle between the president and the parliament of Brazil. Says Mr. Doherty, quote, What happened in Brazil on April 1st did not just happen, it was planned. And planned months in advance. Many of the trade union leaders, some of whom were actually trained in our institute, were involved in the revolution and in the overthrow of the Goulart regime. Immediately prior to the, the, uh, the military takeover in Brazil, uh, there was a group of students from Brazilian unions in training uh, in Front Royal. Uh, this wasn't the first of the Brazilian groups that have been here, nor has it been the last. We've, we've had them continuously. They weren't uh, in any kind of a course 
training for revolutionary activities or clandestine activities. They were in a regular collective bargaining course. It so happens that when many of those students went back home from that course, their unions were involved in this struggle uh, against the attempt of the communists to take over some of the unions, and that's precisely what I meant by the statement. I can say to you categorically now that it is not true. Well, Under no circumstances have, uh, have we ever received or solicited any money from the CIA. It doesn't say that the AFL-CIO received it. The 33 million doesn't go to the AFL-CIO. It goes to the AIFLD. Well, let, me, let me state that these unions you mentioned have, have stated just as categorically as I have that they do not receive and have not received CIA money. The communists are going to accuse anything that is effective as being CIA because I think the CIA and the communist uh, KGB have long been involved in an international struggle. Uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, our books are and are now and always have been open to the public. Our funds, that our government funds, are appropriated by the Congress. Uh, the congressional committees have completely ac all total access to them. I was keeping books and everything else uh, where all my expenses were going. When they came to me, they sent a curio and they said, you know, we understand you have books and everything else, you know. And I said, how in the hell do you know? Uh, we know what you're doing. Huh? We don't want you to keep books. We don't want you to keep any records at all. Because what would happen if the communists would raid your office? Huh? Then they would know who, who's getting money from, uh, from us, uh, while, you know, what you're spending money on and everything else. As long as you show results, we don't care what you do with the money. So I used to travel with briefcases full of money alone. Didn't you also use that money, for example, to uh, buy weaponry? No. I didn't, uh, because my field workers did that. They did that actually on their own. No? They were aware of the fact that we were having a revolution, no? and that the day was going to come. No? An exiled Brazilian colonel had this to say. In 1961, the CIA started an internal preparation for a military coup. First, they created a propaganda network with specialized personnel. And these people attempted to exploit all of the government errors and difficulties. And in the meanwhile, they spread disinformation and they created slogans which had nothing to do with the real situation. And all of this was to prove to the broad masses of people that Brazil was on its way to communism and that democracy had to be defended. So they organized Comde, the Women's Campaign for Democracy. And they directed this principally at women playing on the feeling that women mainly have for the family and religion. We began these so-called uh, marches for God and peace, the so-called pots and pan demonstrations. We talked in terms of a, uh, hundreds of thousands, say, that demonstrating in Rio and in Sao Paulo. And I think it was the women that obliged the military to, to, to move in and take over. That happened in Chile ten years later. Almost uh, the whole scenario was the same, which leads one to believe that there may have been some Brazilian uh, advisors, or some Brazilian advisors, say, uh, uh, in Chile at the same time, fomenting the the revolution against the Allende. On the day before the coup, Castelo Branco, who was then the chief of the army general staff, could not make up his mind. He wasn't sure that the coup would be successful. General Vernon Walter personally went to tell him that, yes, he should join the coup because, in case it was needed, the uh, American fleet and naval task force was sailing close to the coast of Espiritu Santo, where the Marines would land to support the coup forces. And it was for this reason that Castello Branco decided to support the coup. Anti-Goulart demonstrations that greeted the now deposed Brazilian president at Miami airport when he was en route to take office in 1961 show the deep distrust that has finally led to his downfall and exile in Uruguay. Groups had to be called out in Brasilia to quell the bitter protests of thousands against the notoriously left-leaning Joao Goulart's taking office. 
A Russian trade show in Rio de Janeiro gave President Goulart, who paradoxically is a millionaire rancher, a chance to hobnob with some of his Soviet heroes. But it was his sympathies with nearer at hand Fidel Castro that the Brazilians really feared. Riotings against Goulart were frequent. Yet when the end of his regime came, it was through a brief and bloodless military coup. What his successors can do with the almost totally wrecked economy he leaves behind him is a matter of concern to the entire Western Hemisphere. Did you have arms stashed right there in your office? Yeah, they were right there in my closet, yeah. What kind of weapons were they? Should, should name it. Machine guns, uh, uh, all types of weapons. Huh? Did your field workers participate at all in that uh, oh, yeah. coup? What'd they do? They burnt out the uh, communist headquarters. They burnt up the whole damn building. My own people. Yeah. All, all I knew was that the communists had uh, been put away in prisons. They, uh, the military had brought in ships, put them in the bay, and confined uh, the communists, you know, put them in ships, locked the doors and thrown the keys away and whatever. There were a lot of communists in the labor movement there that you knew about oh, putting in jail? There were more of them than us. More. And they were all jailed? They were all thrown in jail. I remember my family was very much against uh, the Goulart government. They were very happy with the coup. The coup did answer the middle class's earnings for better order and uh, against the inflation. I mean, the middle classes were quite prepared for that kind of thing. That uh, Goulart was bringing communism, and communism would bring down family, uh, property, and uh, no more order, law. And that's where my family, more or less, is very typically of the rest. I was in the secondary movement secondary students' movement. Little by little, I started getting closer and closer to, to the people on the left. In 65, 66, and 67, the student movement was the first one to start reorganizing again. There were many different demonstrations against the government, but um, one of them in early March, 68, they were protesting for a better restaurant, and a student was killed. And that sparkled the whole chain of demonstrations, and more people got killed and more demonstrations because uh, by then the petty bourgeoisie that um, in 64 was for the coup started suffering because of the coup. The military government brought in a lot of um, repression. People started actually being arrested and taken to court and uh, being tortured. The police program began uh, on a large scale under Dwight Eisenhower. He felt there was a need to train the police to help with the uh, fighting of communism after the Second World War. He recruited for the purpose a man named Byron Engel. Byron Engel was, uh, by the time he came into this program, a member of the CIA. After the Bay of Pigs, Engel's program was much expanded police from around the world were brought and trained by U.S. advisors. The training was to make them more efficient, but a third of the training was given over in one way or another to make them aware of the communist menace and to go back into their countries to fight communism. Immediately when you're arrested, you have, you have to tell your house, you have, we're supposed to, they force you, they, they try to force you to tell what, um, where you live, who, other addresses you know, where you meet, because that's where they get their information from. Um, the situation is so difficult that they dare not put uh, infiltrators. They have not courage, no possibility of actually infiltrating the left. It's too dangerous. So um, the only way they get their information is through torture. Whenever one could get the information about a specific high-ranking official in, in torture. Not one of these men off the street, but a man who had based his career on his ability to extract information from political prisoners. 
In the cases that I investigated, I found that they had been trained at a United States base. Well, they started asking some questions, they wouldn't say anything, and then they started immediately torturing me after the doctor left. And, uh, I mean, it's the same story of so many people. It's torture, electric shocks, and uh, beatings, and telephones, and finally, it's a few hours like that. Many of the people I spoke with, exiles, political exiles in Europe, had been tortured with U.S. Army field telephones. They were simple, they were easy to operate, and we had sent them in large numbers as part of our military assistance plan. You hook up wires to the telephone, and you put one wire perhaps um, on a man's penis and another in his mouth. When they're put in the mouth, the torturer uses a rubber glove. This is done with a certain degree of surgical precision. There is no embarrassment um, among the torturers, I was told, about the handling of genitals. Although when women are tortured, oftentimes the higher ranking officials will find an excuse to come by and watch the torture. I decided that I would confirm everything they wanted. It was in such a condition, um, they certainly wouldn't uh, settle for less. And uh, I didn't want to go through any more torture. I was, um, ideologically, I was weak enough to, to say, if they know, why not? What we brought to it, what we as, as the United States, through our efficient system, brought, was the sense that you used only the amount of torture appropriate to get information. And the reason torture persists is that although the can't among the police officers is that torture is not an effective way to get information, it of course is. And torture is a necessity of the system, not, uh, not because some minds, um, sick minds think of it but because the resistance continues to, to grow. It's, um, it's a sporadic thing, in small form, but it's always there. Torture is the answer to that. We were unsuccessful in our efforts to weaken the left in Uruguay during the period when I was in Uruguay, 1964 to 1966. Our job, in the face of the growth of the strength of the left during that period, was to promote repression. It was the only alternative we had. In 1966, we brought in a, a CIA officer who set up his office in the police department under the cover of the public safety mission of AID. This officer was to work exclusively with the police intelligence, trying to improve its capabilities. This officer was still there in 1970 at the time that the American Public Safety Mission Chief, uh, Dan Mitrioni, was kidnapped and executed by the Tupamaros. Mitrion was the small city cop in Richmond, Indiana. He had advanced to the position of chief of police and had heard about Byron Engel's program in Washington, applied, and of course he was exactly the sort of person they were looking for to send abroad. Diligent, hardworking. Dan exemplified the highest principles of the police profession, that of social service. He served in Brazil for seven years, at the International Police Academy in Washington for two, and in Montevideo for one. There are a quarter of a billion people in Latin America. In many of these countries, the communist terrorists are trying to tear the fabric of democracy apart. Some of these countries, Uruguay among them, realize that the best protection against this is the development of a democratic police and have asked the United States to help. And this is what Dan was doing in Uruguay. Mitrione was a tough professional by 1969. He had spent nine years in the program. He had been in Brazil where there had been a, a great deal of repression and refinement of 
uh, torture as an interrogation technique. And he went to Uruguay to get information. Some time ago, an officer of the Uruguayan Armed Forces made this uh, photograph public. This testimony is from Dr. Hugo Villar, who is an Uruguayan exile. He said, here you see an almost naked prisoner with a hood. Practically all of the prisoners are hooded, which is a measure taken so that they cannot identify their torturer. Daniel Mitrioni, efficient-looking, congenial in manner. This is the testimony of Manuel Evia, an AID official from 1964 to 1970 in Uruguay. He's testifying about Mitrioni. He says, Mitrioni was a perfectionist. He supervised every detail. He insisted on checking everything. During the training sessions, he directed and personally executed each aspect. This question of perfectionism, he insisted on an economy of effort. He used to say, precise pain in the precise place at the precise time. You must be careful. You should avoid excesses. Another phrase of his was this, remember that the death of the person interrogated constitutes a failure of the technician because that's what he considered himself, a technician. One of the um, pieces of equipment that had been found useful were, was a wire so very thin that it could be fitted um, into the mouth between the teeth and by pressing against the gums um, increase the electrical charge and it was through the diplomatic pouches that Mitrione got some of the equipment he needed for the interrogations, including these fine wires. Several street beggars were picked up whose disappearance would attract no attention. This was a technique that Mitrioni had developed, or rather perfected, in Brazil before coming to Uruguay. Using these beggars, experiments were conducted with different forms of interrogation, letting the students see the effects of different voltages on different parts of the human body, male and female. All these unhappy people died without really knowing why they were undergoing this pain without even having the possibility of answering any question because they were not asked any questions. They were simply guinea pigs. In Los Fresnos, Texas, the CIA ran for the police program uh, a school in the construction of bombs. Students came from around the world, particularly Latin America, they were instructed in the manufacture of plastic, homemade bombs to destroy radio stations, automobiles. Dan Mitrion sent uh, students from Uruguay to that school. Uh, they came from all over Latin America. The idea was that you had to be particularly trustworthy. and You were pledged not to talk about any of the activities, but the courses were run by CIA personnel. The death squads were very active in 1972 or 1973. This was denounced in the Uruguayan Congress before the Congress was dissolved, and uh, it was mainly denounced when the Tupamaros kidnapped one of the main leaders, one of the main uh, heads of the death squad called Nelson Barvesio. Uh, he was uh, a CIA agent. He confessed he was a CIA agent. He was trained in the United States. He was paid by the uh, Central Intelligence Agency of the United States to uh, work. Uh, the, you know, the face, the way, the way they hide his work was he had a, uh, he was a photographer, he had a laboratory, uh, but he was uh, organizing all these death squads. He participated in a lot of assassinations and bombings. Nelson Bardesio was sent to Buenos Aires to train with the Argentinian police. From that trip, he brought back to uh, Montevideo charges of plastic explosive, and that plastic material for bombs was used against um, 
political figures on the left by the police who went around Montevideo in police cars at night um, bombing political opponents. Every CIA station during that period, and I would expect today, was required to maintain what was called the subversive control watch list. This was a list of the most important left-wing political activists um, in the city or in the country, and the list would include not only their name, but their the name of their mother, the name of their father, of their children, of their wife, their address where they live, the address where they worked, the places they would go with their friends, um, clubs they might belong to, uh, where they would um, undertake their leisure activities, everything we might need to know to for sudden action against that person. These lists would be usually maintained in the CIA offices and kept up to date. But whenever necessary, they were turned over to the local police or the local military authorities for action on the part of those authorities. The Uruguayan death squad started acting in Buenos Aires, in Argentina, and some of our best uh, friends and aides were kidnapped and assassinated. The prominent leaders who were kidnapped were Hector Gutierrez Ruiz and Senator Selmar Michelini. They were both kidnapped and assassinated the same night. That very night, they went after my father and myself. When we started living in Argentina, we had to register in the police headquarters. And the first uh, three or four weeks, we lived in an apartment in the street, in a street called Suipacha. Then we moved to the apartment where we lived, you know, where my parents lived for two years and I lived for the last uh, eight months. And the only place where we had the old address registered was the police headquarters. And it was to our old address where they went after us. El asesinato de, de estos líderes políticos de Uruguay the murder of these political leaders in Uruguay is actually part of an international campaign which includes the assassination of the Chilean generals Schneider and Prata. The attempt against Leighton in Europe the murder of Orlando Letelier, the former Chilean ambassador in the United States. The killing of Torres, the president of Bolivia. As well as the murders of scores of Uruguayan, Chilean, Bolivian, Argentinian and Brazilian patriots which has occurred in different parts of America or in Europe, in their country or in other countries. Mitrioni's presence and actions in Uruguay do not represent the excesses of a single individual. He went to Uruguay to accomplish a mission, to fulfill a task, to coordinate a part of the advisory program the CIA undertook in the police headquarters in Montevideo. Starting in Mitrioni's time, there was a qualitative increase in the tortures, beatings, and killings. The brutality persisted, but he introduced the refinements of modern technology. Next, you will hear the actual voices of Mitrioni and his captors. Well, now, tell me something about the CIA. Well, you know, you're not going to believe me. And no matter what, what, uh, uh, I have to convince you that I tell the truth. I know nothing about the CIA. Absolutely nothing about the CIA. How do you think the Uruguayan government would behave now, you know? I hope they bargain with you. <laughs> yes, we hope it too. We don't like you. Yeah. Well, I, the only thing I regret all about this, I, I, I don't like one thing, and that is too many innocent people suffer. Yes. And my wife and children, all that. there's no reason for them to be suffering. I'm sorry about them too. I'm sorry about all the families of our friends who are in prison, been tortured or killed. Well, I'm sure and there are many, really, many innocent people has to suffer. The government of Uruguay, bolstered by a new policy of Richard Nixon not to deal with revolutionaries, resisted every attempt to exchange political prisoners for Mitrione's life. 
The result was that a deadline was set some 10 days after he was captured uh, for release of 150 political prisoners or Mitrion would be killed. The government did not respond to that warning. Mitrion's body was found the following day in an abandoned car on a side street in Montevideo. <laughs> Callous murder emphasizes the essential inhumanity of the terrorist. The American people join the president in condemning this cold-blooded crime against a defenseless human being. Mr. Mitrioni's devoted service to the cause of peaceful progress in an orderly world will remain as an example for free men everywhere. I wish to emphasize again that the United States government or any of its plots were not involved in this coup attempt in any way or shape and also that it is our policy to not intervene in the affairs, internal affairs of another country. American involvement in Chile was almost uh, totally, it was pervasive in every sense. The American ambassador in Chile, when I arrived there, was expected to act as a proconsul. Uh, part of that was his legal responsibilities, that is the Congress in passing laws governing aid, uh, had made the American ambassador responsible for uh, not only uh, reporting on, but justifying American actions in every sector of human activity that you might think of. These involvements grew out of a covert involvement that had begun in the early 1960s. From about 1963 to 1973, we gave a lot of assistance, many millions of dollars, to the socialist, uh, to the uh, center democratic forces in Chile the Nationalist Party, the Christian Democratic Party, some of the free, free press, uh, some of the other organizations in Chilean society. And that was designed to strengthen them against Allende's strength, supported by Castro. Through the CIA, through AID money, uh, through the use of multinationals, a concentrated, coordinated program uh, had been launched out of the White House, the purpose of which was to stop Allende from being elected president of Chile in 1964 and to elect the Christian Democrats and to make of the Christian Democratic experience a model for all of Latin America. This essentially was the program that CIA conducted. There was one exception to that for a period of about six weeks in 1970. I think we will win because I have profound faith in the political consciousness of the people despite the inequality of the contending forces in the struggle but I have absolute faith and confidence in the political awareness of the people and the loyalty of the national majority which will support the program of the Popular Unity Coalition and its candidate. During that time, at the direct order of our president, CIA went down to really try to activate a military action against Allende when he was just named as president. When Allende was elected, uh, the, uh, um, there were two things that then happened. On the one hand, there was a public constitutional gimmick thought up by the lame duck Frey government to block Allende from becoming president. And I was ordered by, in a secret cable on September 15, 1970 to contact Frey and determine just how far he was going to go in this way and offered $250,000 at my discretional use in support of this what they described as this constitutional ploy. On that same day, they sent secret instructions to the CIA chief, who was just as upset as anybody on getting these instructions and protested them to, to
to carry out a plot with Chilean dissident uh, military general, retired general, to block Allende's uh, uh, election by any means short of what they call the Dominican type uh, Marine and U.S. Marine invasion, uh, to block his inauguration. And that plot uh, went forward on the specific orders of Nick's behind the back of the State Department and behind my back. Everybody knew who Allende was because he had been a candidate for so many times before. And everybody knew especially United States companies, that he was going to nationalize the copper mining. Copper is our main wealth, and it was an irony that it was not in our hands, but that wealth was used to enrich multinational companies. Mr. McComb, in 1970, did you have occasion to discuss the Chilean presidential elections with Mr. Helms then director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Yes, I did. Did you evidence your concern over the outcome of the Chilean election to Mr. Helms? It was uh, our opinion, and this had been discussed in the board meeting of ITT, that Mr. Allende becoming president and uh, carrying out his policies would have a very serious effect on, uh, on this country as well as the uh, business interests involved. Nixon? called Richard Helms and ordered him to proceed with this plot with the Chilean military to try to thwart the inauguration of Allende. And I, in my view, the uh, CIA chief, Helms, would not have gone, uh, uh, just taken uh, such an instruction uh, without any discussion. That is to say, he must have said to the president, as I uh, happen to know that he did, that he must have said to the president, Yes, this is feasible. This is not impossible, as your ambassador is saying. We, at this point, had, beginning, had begun to talk to the Kissinger office and the State Department about the, what might happen when Ms. Dr. Allende was, was elected, if he was elected. I sent two cables on September 27th and October 7th to the White House, to the 40 Committee, saying, and it went to the State Department's representative on that as well, the undersecretary, saying that if anybody were thinking of a plot with the Chilean military, it would be, quote, a second bay of pigs. And the second of these two cables, I said I had discovered that the CIA had countermanded my, del my specific orders and was meeting with representatives of a group called, or an extreme right-wing group called Patria y Libertad. They had been put off limits by me, as had the general with whom they were secretly plotting. Well, uh, and I asked in that cable, what else might they be up to? International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, International Headquarters, October 16th, 1970. Personal and confidential. The Armed Forces boss, General René Schneider, is fully aware of the danger of Allende moving in. But he will not move an inch without phrase okay. One retired General Vio is all gung-ho about moving immediately. Schneider has threatened to have Vio shot if he moves unilaterally. Unless there's a move by dissident Chilean military elements, Salvador Allende will be inaugurated as president November 4th. I got an order to go right back to Washington and report to Kissinger on Monday, October 12th. And as, when I went in to see Kissinger, uh, and in the course of talking to him, said that only a madman would be dealing with this G General Vio, the dissident general, or any Chilean military plotter, uh, 30 seconds later, he leaped up and he said, uh, would you like to see the president? Obviously, I didn't know that I had touched a, uh, a very sensitive nerve when I, when I said that only a madman would be plotting since they were already plotting. That's the end of the second in our three-part series featuring the award-winning documentary on company business. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 787 one three. Bye. The CIA wielded its hand in Chile in 1973. And later on, even while the Senate struggled to figure out exactly what that hand was doing, the ever active CIA was pushing a strong arm in Angola. And then the CIA's favorite success story, came to an end. 
the CIA in the 70s on Company Business. The last in our three-part series featuring the award-winning documentary on Company Business, right now on Alternative Views. International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, International Headquarters, October 16, 1970. Personal and confidential. The Armed Forces boss, General Rene Schneider, is fully aware of the danger of Allende moving in, but he will not move an inch without phrase OK. One retired General Vio is all gung-ho about moving immediately. Schneider has threatened to have Vio shot if he moves unilaterally. Unless there's a move by dissident Chilean military elements, Salvador Allende will be inaugurated as president November 4th. I got an order to go right back to Washington and report to Kissinger on Monday, October 12th. And as, when I went in to see Kissinger, uh, in, in the course of talking to him, said that only a madman would be dealing with this G General V.O., the dissident general, or any Chilean military plotter, uh, 30 seconds later he leaped up and he said, uh, would you like to see the president? Obviously, I didn't know that I had touched a, uh, a very sensitive nerve when I, when I said that only a madman would be plotting since they were already plotting. And uh, within five minutes, we were walking across uh, the White House, and we went into the Oval Office of the President. And as I came through the door, the President greeted me, and he shut the door. And while we were standing right in front of the door, the three of us, he's, he started to say, uh, smack his fist, saying, uh, that son of a bitch, that son of a bitch. And I must have looked uh, sort of surprised, thinking, who, me? And he said, uh, uh, not you, Mr. Ambassador, you always tell it like it is. It's, it's that son of a bitch, Allende. And then he led us to the desk. I sat to his left at the big desk, and to his right uh, was Kissinger. And he launched into a 10-minute monologue uh, describing how he was going to smash Allende within the context of an Allende government, uh, as if Allende was going to be inaugurated without giving a hint that this plot was underway. International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, International Headquarters, Personal and Confidential, October 25, 1970. The elimination of General Rene Schneider from the key command post, Chief of the Armed Forces, makes Allende and the Communists even more vulnerable than before. General Schneider, fatally wounded in an assassination last week, has been described as favorable to Allende. He is known to have consistently blocked coup attempts by more determined general officers. Contrary to the general expectation, the military did not move against Allende over the weekend. It is believed that the killing of Schneider was a prelude to a coup. The words uh, that have been read to you uh, are... As I remember... As I believe I... it should be suggested that the Chile situation warrants high priority by the entire administration and that everything should be done quietly but effectively to see that Allende does not get through the crucial next six months. What else could those words mean? Well, of course, he'd already been president, you know. He's elected by this time. Right. Now you were worried about the next six months, whether he'd get through right. the next six because months. Because of right. the <clears throat> economic situation in Chile was getting critical. And well, it would have gotten a lot more critical if these recommendations had all been carried through, wouldn't it? That's And that was evident. the purpose of the recommendations. Yes. International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, Washington, D.C. Personal and confidential. Subsequent to your call yesterday, I heard from Washington and a representative called on me this morning. We discussed the situation in detail and he made suggestions. The suggestions follow. Banks should not renew credits or should delay in doing so. Companies should drag their feet in sending money, in making deliveries, in shipping spare parts. We should withdraw all technical help and should not provide any technical assistance in the future. The visitor added that money was no problem. He indicated that certain steps were being taken, but that he was looking for additional help aimed at inducing economic collapse. La ITT, la ITT, gigantesca corporación, 
a gigantic corporation whose capital is bigger than the national budgets of several Latin American countries together, and bigger even than that of some of the industrialized nations, launched a sinister plan to prevent me from acceding to the presidency as soon as the people's triumph in the September 1970 elections became known. It was proposed that there be a strangling of the economy, sowing social disorder and panic among the population so that, when the government was overthrown, the armed forces would be impelled to break the democratic system and impose a dictatorship. Before the conscience of the world, I accuse the IT&T of attempting to bring about civil war in my country, the greatest possible source of disintegration of a country. This is what we term imperialist intervention. In Chile from 1972 to 1973, the same sorts of operations were going on there to uh, make it impossible for the Allende regime to govern after earlier attempts to prevent him from taking office failed, such as the assassination of General Snyder and the attempts to bribe the Chilean Congress. Later on, with the help of the international lending institutions and those financial institutions controlled as part of the United States government were able to exert the financial squeeze on Chile, which resulted in great difficulty in obtaining short-term credits, creating scarcity of many different types of products. Then such organizations as the, as the Truckers Union uh, had legitimate grievances on which to, to base their complaints. CIA by financing the, the um, truck drivers and the shopkeepers and the other organizations which professionals for example who um, um, organized against the Allende regime were able to create the conditions and the appearances of chaos and disorganization which will always appeal to right-wing um, discipline-minded military leaders who will intervene and justify their intervention on the restoration of national order of the restoration of national dignity and the obtention of peace. And this, in the case of Chile, of course, and many other countries, is the peace of the grave for a lot of people. I tell you, compañeros, compañeros of so many years, I say it with calmness and absolute peace of mind. I do not have the makings of a messiah. I do not have the attributes of a martyr. I'm a social fighter who is carrying out a task, the task that the people have given me. Let them understand it, those who want history to go backwards and who want to ignore the will of the majority of Chile. Without having the flesh of a martyr, I will not take even one step backwards and I want them to know that I will not leave the Moneda Palace until I have completed the mandate given to me by the people. It is only by riddling me with bullets that they can stop me from my determination to carry out the program of the people. La última vez que hablé con Salvador fue el domingo 9 y el golpe fue el martes 11. Salvador me explicó que la situación se había producido por resistencia de los partidos de la oposición, digamos, de los partidos de la oligarquía, los partidos eh, de la derecha, y que él pensaba que esta situación podría mejorar si el pueblo definía la situación, que se refería esencialmente a las industrias intervenidas, que él iba a llamar a un plebiscito y que el día martes iba a decir un discurso anunciando que se iba a efectuar este plebiscito para que por votación popular 
to definir esta situación. The day before the coup, Orlando had a meeting with Allende. He came back home around 2 a.m. And he told me that next day, that is the 11th, I mean, the 11th, they were going to call for a referendum. They had written a speech for Allende to communicate to people that he was calling a referendum. Three hours later, around 5.30, 6 a.m., the president called and asked Orlando to check about some movement of troops that supposedly were taking place in Valparaiso. Orlando did so and realized that there was not only movement of troops in Valparaiso, but all over the country. And that's how we realized that the coup that was sort of floating in the atmosphere for the past weeks was taking place. En la moneda, Salvador, en conversaciones que lo llamaban por teléfono los militares, eh, diciéndole que se rindiera, Salvador sostuvo hasta el último momento que él no se rendiría nunca. Pero estaba dispuesto que los militares querían terminar con Salvador Allende. Para ellos, la solución era que Salvador Allende renunciara ¿no? y que pudiera irse al exterior ¿no? y decir, bueno, mira, qué cobarde se fue y, y, y renunció y reconoció de que en realidad no podía seguir siendo presidente, lo que era un absurdo, porque él estaba cumpliendo el programa por el cual había sido elegido. Salvador sabía que la única forma era realmente recuperar nuestra riqueza y estaba dispuesto a morir, a, a, a mantenerse en la moneda, a resistir si ellos pretendían matarlo. Y tal era la intención desde el momento que ustedes han visto fotografías de la moneda cuando está bombardeada. ¿Cómo ardió la moneda? We have now been informed that of the death of President Allende. And I'd like to say this, that I do want to express regret on the loss of life in Chile, and particularly that of the Chief of State, President Allende. Well, my reaction is that this is, of course, an internal affair of Chile. We all are distressed at the uh, plight of the Chilean people. Uh, and the failure, really, of the Allende government. Uh, those principles and practices of, of Marxism uh, did not apply to Chile. And the economy went from bad to worse. Inflation was rampant, values were destroyed, incentives were gone, uh, people didn't know how to set their sets of values. Orlando was taken for a few, for a few weeks to a horrible place. It's the, um, the basement of the Air Force Academy, and there he was interrogated, and there he saw hundreds of people being tortured. La gente oye hablar de lo que fue el, el, el fascismo, lo que hicieron los nazis, de, y, y se imagina que esto ha terminado, que, 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 no, que no puede existir este sistema. Y aquí vemos que ha brotado de nuevo en Latinoamérica, porque no es solo en Chile, también la crueldad y, y, y la violencia y las torturas se aplican en Brasil, en Uruguay, en Bolivia. Es decir, hay una opresión a estos países que son países que les están proporcionando riqueza a todas estas grandes empresas y que los tienen sometidos, pero que están reaccionando porque cada día crece la resistencia. Yo estoy convencida de que el momento de liberación para Latinoamérica va a llegar. Puede ser que demore un poco, 
pero va a llegar, porque un pueblo se agota. La paciencia tiene un límite y la miseria no, no puede seguir en esa forma. Is it conceivable that, in, for instance, in some countries in Latin America, and take the example of the coup in Chile, that, uh, that the interests of Chileans at some point might conflict with the interests of the United States? And then what would be a viable United States policy vis-a-vis -vis that country? For example, uh, are the people in Chile better off now than, than they were under Allende? We'll really know most about that when we finally have elections in Chile, and when will that be? We don't really know. What you've done is, um, pose the dilemma that people who are in clandestine operations must face many times during their life. Uh, sometimes these practitioners have problems of personic, personal ethics and morality. Am I doing something that's not really good for the people? Furthermore, I've noted in intelligence operations that usually we've gotten into trouble when we've tried to help people who didn't really want to be helped very much. What it boils down to is, is it really something in our national interest that must be done. In the past, in the atmosphere of the Cold War, and even in the 60s, the American public without question felt that their presidents should go ahead and be firm on things like this and be sure that our interests around the world were stoutly defended. That's beginning to change to some degree. But I'm afraid it all goes back to that Oval Office in the White House and the kind of decisions that are made there the perceptions that are made there. Otherwise, an intelligence organization or a practitioner of intelligence finds himself in the position of, I don't like this. It really shouldn't be done. My personal opinion is that it's wrong. What do you do then? Do you resign in protest? Mr. Kissinger, during the time under uh, review, was the president's advisor on uh, international security affairs and then became the secretary of state. So we needed uh, his testimony to determine what the administration policy was toward uh, uh, Chile in this particular period. His presence here should not be interpreted as meaning that he himself was ever involved in um, any uh, uh, plot uh, to assassinate any foreign figure. being as polite as I can about it, this is what he's told me to do. Yes, sir. As uh, so long as the matter is in the court, I'm saying nothing. What Helms simply did in this case, when he saw that he was going to be hanged, may escape bill, he simply uh, said, um, all right, here are roughly a hundred items in which I'm going to demand discovery on uh, in the process of my, of my defense. And if one went read down through the list, it was quite obvious that he was not going to hang alone. Kissinger would hang with him, Rusk would hang with him, Ford, uh, Nixon, and all sorts of other people. And therefore, he got off with just a slap on the wrist. Senator Church, of course, uh, signed the final report of the Church Committee, and one of the comments in there was that CIA was not out of control. Uh, after his investigations, in other words, he had first asked it as a question as to whether the CIA was out of control, a rogue elephant. And uh, he was satisfied by his investigation that indeed no. Uh, the House Committee uh, com said that uh, far from the problem being CIA being out of control, he it thought that it was too much under the control of presidents and did their, their will over the years. Initially in the uh, investigation, we went into the area of the oversight function of, of, of the Congress. The Constitution charged the Congress of the United States with not only uh, enacting laws and appropriating money, but overseeing the executive branch of government. And in our investigation and overseeing 
uh, in investigating and evaluating the oversight function of the Congress, what we came up with was, number one, that the Congress of the United States had totally failed miserably in its oversight function. Mr. Dulles, would you approve Congressman Lindsay's uh, suggestion of a watchdog congressional committee over the CIA? Well, I do not uh, favor it, but I think that is a matter for the Congress and the President uh, to decide primarily. At the present time, there are several committees, the Armed Services Committees and the Appropriations Committees, which review the work of CIA, and I think they're doing a very competent job. The Congress is a group-oriented process of 435 people. It's broken down into a number of major committees and subcommittees. Uh, we have several committees charged with responsibility of overseeing the conduct of the intelligence community. And we saw a, a pattern established, a pattern where the intelligence community would either brief only the chairperson of the committee with respect to uh, various operations and even uh, abuses. Sometimes they would uh, brief the chairperson and the ranking minority member, and in some instances they would, rank, would uh, uh, brief only a few members of the committee. So in a great number of instances, it was not the entire committee, that subcommittee that ever was briefed. And I have not recalled at any time historically where the subcommittee, once it had been briefed on questionable acts by the intelligence community, that they ever took that information to their full committee. And we certainly never in history had an extraordinary uh, session of the United States Congress to look at the serious nature of the uh, allegations. I prefer to leave it stand where it is. I can't imagine the British Parliament investigating British B4. And I can't imagine the French Chamber of Deputies investigating the French Surete. And I can't imagine the Russian Presidio investigating the MVD. Why, it's, that's absolutely fantastic to think about. Well, it's a gathering of intelligence secretly. And, uh, you, you've got to use those methods, and when you come out and go to examining and exposing and analyzing publicly everything they do, you destroy the CIA. There were a number of them that said uh, quite clearly on the floor of the Senate that they didn't want to know certain things. Uh, one senator referred to, if, if you're going to have an intelligence service, you're going to have to shut your eyes, take what's coming. <laughs> Three months after the day that the last helicopter left the embassy rooftop in Saigon, the CIA flew its first plane load of arms uh, to Angola, starting another third world conflict where the enemy uh, selected by the CIA, no one has attacked us, but we've selected an enemy, is uh, supposedly a threatening communist force, supposedly a Soviet effort to take over uh, part of Africa, and we were marching in there to stop them. January 15, 1975, the three Angolan liberation movements got together under the supervision of the Portuguese and agreed to peaceful competition for elections to run the country. Secretary Kissinger's reaction was to say, get me an options paper on what we can do there. Colby came back and ordered the CIA uh, Africa Division Chief to write up an options paper in a half a day's time. Two days after that, the first plane uh, flew to Angola with the arm. What will the United States do? Uh, that is not a subject that I'm free to talk about. Is the United States involved in any way? That is not a subject that I'm free to talk about. Uh, can you deny the report that the CIA has been funneling money into Angola? I'm just not going to talk about that subject. When will the American people find out exactly what is happening over there? I don't know. They wanted to know were any Americans involved in the conflict and were we sending any arms in despite our denials and were we involved with South Africa and were we, we recruiting the mercenaries who were showing up there. And so then you started recruiting this for the CIA or were you just working on contract? No, no, I, I, I'm working for FNLA. The uh -huh. FNLA is receiving their money from the CIA. We had four, uh, it's, it's common knowledge. I'm not blowing smoke on the CIA. I, I support the CIA uh, and their activities. We had, uh, well, I can name 24 CIA paramilitary specialists who were inside Angola training and advising 
and helping to prepare battle plans and uh, installing communications equipment and helping to run the war. Life and death are realities in Angola. I would assume that virtually everyone involved there has some degree of knowledge with respect to what, if any, when, where, why, how, and under what circumstance the United States may or may not be involved in Angola. However, there is one party that has no knowledge of American involvement in war, and that is the United States people, as the people of the United States, and their representatives. Now, how do you justify that? The War Powers Act requires that the Congress be informed before the commitment of the United States Armed Forces. In the legislative history leading up to the adoption of that law, the proposal was made that that would include any involvement of any paramilitary or other forces in such activities abroad. That provision was stricken and was not adopted by the Congress in the legislative history. There were three foreign white mercenary armies involved in Angola, all three of them, CI money and CI management. Let me tell you why I do it, and uh, uh, because I don't want to wash dishes. I don't want to drive a truck. Uh, I, uh, I don't uh, want to carry a lunch bucket from uh, 8 to 5, 9 to 5, and have a 15-minute coffee break uh, between 10 o'clock and whatever. It just isn't my style. When the adventurers got to Kinshasa, they were briefed by the CIA. They were flown into Angola in CIA aircraft. They were armed with CIA weapons. The leaders were briefed every day with CIA photography of the enemy position. I'd like to ask you whether or not CIA or any American uh, government institution or department or agency is involved in recruiting mercenaries in any official or unofficial capacity, directly or indirectly. It depends how you define indirectly. They supported, the CIA supported uh, President Helen Roberto with $25 million in cash and $25 million in arms. Why would uh, the President and Dr. Kissinger want to go into Angola? I think basically uh, two reasons. Number one, uh, the old Cold War rationale of stemming the Soviet tide uh, uh, wherever that occurs, even though that goes contrary to the entire history of the African continent, just as indeed our entry in Vietnam went contrary to the history of Southeast Asia. Uh, number two, uh, President Mobutu of Zaire uh, has been a supporter of Dr. Kissinger's policies, of U.S. policy. He's assisted our policy in other areas of the world, not just in Africa, but in the Middle East. And his relative, uh, Holden Roberto, is the faction that we're backing in Angola. I toured the northern battlefront with Holden Roberto uh, in, a, in a Volkswagen bus. Uh, and we went down to the Barado Dande, where a battle had just been fought, the Sasalimba Road Junction, where we could stand in front of this, this uh, uh, marker that showed how many kilometers it was to Luanda. By early September, the MPLA, our selected, our chosen enemies, were winning, and our allies, the FNLA, particularly in the north, and the UNITA forces in the south were on the defensive, losing ground. Our solution was to fly in two battalions of Zarian paracommandos and C-130 aircraft into the conflict, complete with light armor and uh, light artillery. <laughs> The Zarian commandos were foreign troops introduced into the conflict, answered by Cubans introduced into the conflict. When the Cubans went in, Fidel Castro uh, went on television in Havana and spoke at length of why they had to go in. And he had his ambassador uh, give a speech at the UN General Assembly announcing Cuba's uh, intentions and needs, the reasons they felt it was necessary to go into Angola. The United States was the only major party involved that was lying about what it was doing. This imaginative station chief in Lusaka put out the story in which he, he uh, reported a totally fictitious scene in which Cuban soldiers had raped some 15-year-old Ovimbundu maidens. And uh, this was the perfect touch, pure nonsense very much contradictory of what the Cubans were doing and the way they were conducting themselves in Angola, but uh, the right flavor the CIA would like to play with. 
And then he kept that going for three months. You see, he had these same Cuban soldiers captured in a battle. He had them put on trial by, uh, with, uh, before a tribunal of these same women who had been raped, and then eventually executed with photographs, mind you, of the trial and photographs of the execution of these young women who had been raped, killing the Cubans who had raped them. Would you consider the Soviets' involvement in Angola serious, or the Cubans? I think they are very serious about their involvement there. Is it serious? Could you elaborate on that point, uh, Mr. Cohen? I think the quantity of their assistance uh, indicates that they are very serious about their involvement there. Is the Soviet and Cuban involvement serious enough to warrant some kind of United States aid? I think I'd leave that to the Secretary of State and the President of the so Mr. Kissinger's report of yesterday is accurate that we are bundling several millions of dollars to Angola through Zaire. I don't know what Mr. Kissinger said specifically, but uh, I have always found Mr. Kissinger to be very accurate. Is the 25 million or 50 million figure accurate? That is not a subject I'm going to talk about. In the South, where the Cubans and the MPLA had the initiative, UNITA was losing. They were almost helpless. So they brought in the South Africans. That's they being Savimbi, but also the CIA coordinating with South Africa and encouraging them to come into the conflict, which they did. By early November, our CIA managers were begin beginning to crow a little bit. The Lusaka station sent in a cable saying that in a few days, the MPLA's back would be broken. Approaching the 11 November Independence Date, Mobutu's paracommandos tried to attack Luanda and his task force of 1,500 men in light armor were caught out in the open and shell rocketed with these 122 millimeter rockets. And after that, the United States effort was out of business. It makes no difference whether the United States uniforms are in any way in Angola or any other country, but if we are giving money, or weapons, or providing any other support that results in the death of human beings, then I think to give a technical response to the question is not responsive to the gut issue that I'm raising. CIA and the United States government is in compliance with the decision made by the Congress as to how this question should be answered. The Congress had an opportunity to require more than it did. It did not. It decided not to. And in the course of its decisions, in the course of the laws adopted by the Congress, it clearly left a field for this activity. Senator Clark went on a tour of Africa to confer with all of the Southern Africa heads of state about the Angola conflict, just to be the congressional authority about the validity of the conflict. As he traveled, we began to get reports from each embassy he visited of what he had said to this person or that in the embassy, and it, it began, it began to, to seem very clear that he was not sympathetic uh, to what we were doing. So we sent out uh, cables urging everyone to try harder to keep us better informed of what he was finding uh, as he went to the different countries. And then eventually, when he was coming around finally to Kinshasa, we sent a cable ordering the chief of station to see President Mobutu and President uh, Roberto of the FNLA and prepare them on what they should and should not say to Senator Clark about the situation in Angola. The original request by the CIA was for 100 million That's correct. That's correct. That's my understanding of it. And then when that ran into some oppo opposition, it was dropped down to It was what? dropped down to the 28 to 35 million dollar figure that we're now talking about. And, and uh, what you're trying to do is uh, force the CIA to, to eat what it's already spent. I don't want them, I mean, as far as what we've expended in Angola, uh, to consider that uh, uh, money thrown away, that's exactly the way I view it. I just don't want to pay the further price that's going to be attached to any further activity on, uh, on our part. Colonel Peter McLeese had me fly him up to the presidential palace in Kinshasa, Zaire, President Holden Roberto's palace. We met with four CIA agents that uh, informed us to evacuate Angola. They could not resupply us uh, with money or arms because of public opinion in the U.S. President Holden Roberto took a phone call from the State Department 
and as far and as far as I know, it was from Henry Kissinger. He had a conversation with Henry, and uh, uh, President Juan Roberto was very upset at the uh, conclusion of the telephone conversation. Could you come tomorrow morning? Could you just explain briefly, sir, what the situation is? Just well, very, uh, very uh, briefly. Well, uh, um, uh, just just one late. minute, sir. Could you just tell well, us in, in one minute? Make it, make, let us make it tomorrow morning, okay? President Holden Roberto asked us uh, if we would try to hold out without any support uh, as long as we could. We told him we would. And that's the reason South Salvador turned into an Alamo. <laughs> He went because he felt what he was doing was right. He thought it would take care of our financial problems. You didn't want him to go, did you? I knew that it was going to be dangerous, but I had no idea this would be the result. Daniel Montgomery Gerhardt, Pauline Elizabeth Gerhardt. Washington, D.C., the United States. American. Our son is uh, imprisoned uh, in Angola. He was convicted as a mercenary. And uh, what sentence did he get? 16 years. State Department uh, called us the first part of March and said that he was missing in Angola. The stand that they have taken is that it's it was not an official venture and therefore they can't do anything officially. This is the their stand. Have you gotten anything at all concrete from the United States government to indicate that they are doing anything? I think that uh, I would uh, personally appreciate it if you would direct some of those questions to the White House. President Neto must understand, and he certainly has been given to understand, that the general attitude of Americans towards Angola will be, uh, will be seriously affected by his actions in the case of Mr. Gear. But we cannot permit our basic foreign policy to be, to be uh, dictated by our concern for the lives of Americans, because this, of individual Americans that may be held prisoner, because this would encourage people to take Americans prisoners all over the world. Do you think, for instance, when you were re recruiting people in conjunction with the CIA, for Angola, that this decision was made by the U.S. government, and they was just didn't back you up. They the decision up. was certainly made a hell of a lot higher up than I was. Do you feel like, do you understand what, what was going on over there? Oh, not really. I mean, uh, I didn't sure really pay much attention to what was going on in Angola. Yeah, we didn't pay too much attention to it until we realized our son was over there. I'm sure that uh, this is true of many people. I thought that it was a matter of uh, real concern that planted stories intended to serve a national purpose abroad um, came home and were circulated here and believed here because uh, this would mean that the CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. Now, we're looking at that very carefully. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA 
who are contributing to a major circulation American journal. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Uh, at CBS, uh, we uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, uh, certain relationships had been established, and I was told about them and asked if I'd carry on with them. We have quite a lot of detailed information, uh, and we will evaluate it, and we will include any um, evidence of wrongdoing or any evidence of impropriety in our final report and make recommendations. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to the national news services, AP and UPI? Well, again, I think we're getting into the kind of detail, Mr. Chairman, that I'd prefer to handle in executive session. Senator, do you think that you name the news organizations in your final report? Uh, that, that remains to be decided. I think it was entirely in order for our correspondents at that time uh, to make use of uh, CIA agent ch uh, chiefs uh, of station and other members of the executive staff of CIA as sources of information which were useful in their assessments of world conditions. Would you say that continues today? Well, I, yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations of the period of the 1970s, uh, it seems to me that a reporter has got to be much more circumspect in doing it now, or he runs the risk of uh, at least being looked at with considerable disfavor by the public. I think you've got to be much more careful about it. I don't think there is any possibility for reform of the CIA. Uh, I gave up my hope uh, of this uh, after uh, seeing the, uh, the poor performance of the, uh, of the church committee, which was infiltrated by CIA people and to some extent sabotaged to some extent, uh, co-opted. Uh, I mean, the people that were working on the, uh, the news media was a CIA guy. There were other CIA people involved. Uh, and the CIA officers themselves say, you know, we didn't, uh, Church didn't get anything we didn't give him. We have uh, government agencies like the Congress, the Senate Committee, for example, oversight of, to oversee the CIA, talking about the agency now being under control and that the abuses of the past have now been eliminated, as if the agency wasn't under control all along, and as if what they call abuses weren't ordered by presidents. The main argument is not with the agency, which is an instrument for policy execution, but the main argument is with the president and the people outside the CIA who determine the interests which have to be protected and how, who determine American foreign policy and then call upon the CIA and other agencies to execute that policy. When they come to the con conclusion as they have with the, uh, the uh, exposés on the media, their connections with the media and um, uh, with, with their involvement in, in uh, drug experiments and so forth. Uh, here they knew the information was, was going to come out. There was no way that they could, they could prevent it. So what they did then was, uh, was to reveal it themselves uh, and uh, using their, their usual uh, uh, deceptive techniques say, well, that's it, that's the end, you know, it's, we've told you everything and that's it, there's nothing more, that's all there is to it. And then they just drop the Iron Curtain and you can't get, get beyond it. What I would like to know, and I know many other people would like to know too, is not only the history but the current relations between the CIA and the SAVAK in Iran, for example. Imagine all the Iranians who would like to know that. With the Kok Kamtiv in Indonesia, imagine the 100,000 political prisoners or so in Indonesia right now who are being 
uh, held without trial and have been some for over 10 years by this security service, which has had its history of relationships with the CIA. Whether the institutional relationship continues with the Korean CIA right now, with the DINA in Chile, with the DOPS and the CODI and the other organizations in um, Brazil, with the Uruguayan security services, with the Argentine Federal Police there. All of these relationships of the past probably continue to today in one degree or another. And I don't see how the uh, Carter administration or any other administration can talk about human rights while these institutional contacts remain and while these services receive in one degree or another support, guidance, um, and encouragement from the CIA. The system is what is wrong. The system is what had to be changed and should be changed so that the, so that the president cannot uh, direct these kind of activities and uh, certain congressmen cannot cover for them and that these men cannot think in those terms of being completely amoral uh, or unethical in, 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 the, in the conduct of their business. I don't know who pulled the trigger on the pistol that killed Richard Welsh. Um, I do know that uh, A.G., in a publication in this country, before uh, Richard Welch was killed, said our job is to obtain the names of all CIA people we can anywhere in the world, obtain a photograph, send them overseas, and see that they're published in a local newspaper, and be sure you give the name and address of their residence. That's what happened in Greece. A.G. declared at the time his book was published, or perhaps even before, in the promotional period, that uh, he was determined to wipe out CIA activity. He felt it was immoral, and uh, one of the best ways to do this was to reveal the names of all the CIA people. So we moved the people so that they wouldn't be subject to violence, uh, but we've had such things as uh, been had reported that children have said that their, their, their playmates in school have uh, commented about the fact that their fathers were mentioned in this book and so forth. And I just think that's a terrible thing for a man who came in, signed an agreement to keep the secrets that he was going to learn in the process of his employment and then go out and violate that agreement. I just think that's plain wrong and I think it should be punishable. In the last three, four, five years, the world has learned a lot more than it ever knew before on what the actual operations were and more and more people have come to oppose the secret intervention and the secret subversion of the institutions in other countries, particularly the people who live in those countries. Now I happen to be on the side of the people who want to see those operations stopped and as long as the government, of our government, the United States, will not stop the operations, then I think that those uh, interested individuals can do whatever they can to try to thwart these efforts at secret penetration abroad. It's my personal conviction that Mr. Agee is working for someone else. But you don't care to say who? I can't. Mr. Agee represents a small segment of the American intelligence organizations I've dedicated the idea of telling everything they can. I call them the kiss and tell boys. I belong to that part that said I signed a secrecy oath, and as much as I'd like to come out with some things, I'm going to honor that secrecy oath. The fact is I never knew Welch in the CIA. I never knew Phillips either. I never worked with either one of them. And much less did I know that Welch was ever sent to Greece, nor did I give his name to anyone. But um, they found it very convenient at that particular point to put the blame for this on me. During um, uh, early 1977, though, through Freedom of Information filings in the United States, uh, secret CIA documents uh, were uh, made public. 
wherein it was discovered that the CIA had, in three separate occasions, during the period between Welch's arrival and his uh, death about a month later, the agency in Washington, the headquarters, had ordered him not to live in the same house that his predecessor had lived in and where his predecessor's predecessor had lived in and, and others because they said in Washington, everyone in Athens knew that that was the station chief's home. And with all of the anti-American feeling going on in Greece at that time, particularly anti-CIA feeling, um, it, would be very, it would be very dangerous. Uh, Welch apparently answered, at least on one occasion, saying that he didn't want to have to drive the extra 20 minutes. He wasn't killed because his name was Richard Welch. He wasn't even killed simply because he was American, or an American government official, or an American embassy officer. He was killed because of the things that people know that the CIA has been doing in Greece for the last 30 years. And that has been to destabilize every effort of the people to organize themselves for change, to install some form of socialism or another. Not a radical form of socialism necessarily, not communism, simply in order to uh, put in a government of more progressive forces than the conservatives, which the Americans were backing for so long. We have managed to go into country after country, the CIA, and promote dictators to take over the country and with, with, with policies of suppressing human rights and, and uh, abusing the human rights of the people in those countries so that take Iran, for example. Uh, this is the favorite success story of the CIA, how it installed the Shah in power, encouraged him into power, trained the Savak so he could stay in power. I think that uh, certainly the United States has been better off under the, with the Shah in command of, of Iran these last 20 odd years. And I believe also the Iranian people have made more progress in their social and economic development in these last 20 years than the alternative of communist totalitarianism. The whole effort of the United States was to keep the Shah in power. The Shah was, uh, was a steadfast friend of the United States, through thick and thin. We told him what to do, we told him how to do it. And there was not any, any uh, preoccupation with the people of Iran. Uh, there, was, there was almost a, a naive uh, trust uh, of, of, of the propaganda coming out of Iran, that the, the people were, uh, were um, firmly behind the Shah, uh, the adulation was uh, spontaneous and, and all pervasive, which was not which was not true. How would you have handled the Iranian crisis differently? I will state the principle that has been uh, one that I have followed in my uh, international operations during the time that I have been in office. And whether it is in uh, Vietnam or whether it is in Iran, uh, you don't grease the skids for your friends. It was 1953 when it was evident to the Shah that uh, some kind of internal security uh, police force was necessary to keep his opposition in check. He came to the United States, and the CIA in particular. The CIA was instrumental organizing SAVAK, the internal security police in Iran. A senior official at the CIA, an official who, who I worked under, 
was over for a period of five years, organizing and establishing SAVAK. In, in SAVAK headquarters in Tehran, there were torture rooms. Uh, this has been, of course, well documented. I, I saw any number of reports uh, from, uh, from people who were tortured, who saw the torture rooms, described them in detail. This was a secret place. Accidentally, they found this place, people. And we found it is a place of torture. You can go inside and see it. They used to put a tr the man they wanted to torture in the first floor, and the heat was coming from the coke. And he hit him. And if he, would, he wouldn't say anything and resist, they put him in the second floor, which has more heat. And the fourth floor is that nobody could resist. It was so hot, they would burn him. This is a human hand which was cut off. This was inside the house. Savak's policies towards its own people are now uh, pretty well documented, and the rage and bitter anger that's being expressed there towards the United States is a result of the fact that the people are quite aware that the Savak and the Shah were CIA products. <laughs> fanaticism. It is weary of the lies, propaganda, and hysteria created by dictatorship. It is disgusted by the practice of torture and political assassination. Those people behind and beyond the Iron Curtain have seen so much political wickedness and cold-blooded betrayal, such godless depravity in government, that they find it harder to believe in our peaceful intent and decent motives than in the calculated and clever lies that communism is spreading every hour, every day, through every broadcast and newspaper that it controls. But here in America, we pledge ourselves again to raise high the light of freedom, to carry on the struggle against its enemies in every area whether those enemies be the Soviet Union, Castro, or poverty and hunger. Until freedom burns brightly from the Arctic to Cape Horn, and freedom will shine again in Cuba. It is the lot of those in our intelligence agencies that they should work in silence, sometimes fail in silence, but more often succeed in silence. The rewards can never come in public acclaim only in the quiet satisfaction of getting on with the job and trying to do well the work that needs to be done in the interest of your nation. Repeat after me, please. I, Stansfield Turner, do solemnly swear. I, Stansfield Turner, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic that I will well and faithfully discharge that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the the duties of the office on which I am about to enter so help me god so help me god mr director 